Good morning and welcome to the 17th meeting of the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee. Um, I would, may ask all present to turn electrical devices to silent or off if they are likely to interfere with the um, sound system. Uh, I have apologies from committee member Gil Patterson this morning and uh, decision or item one on the agenda is a decision by the committee to take item three in private. Are we all agreed on that? Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, this morning, our first panel of witnesses on the draft energy strategy. Um, we have uh, three uh, witnesses with us today, and may I say to the witnesses that the sound desk will deal with the sound system, so no need to press buttons or do anything apart from speak into the microphone. May I ask committee members and witnesses to try to be as succinct and uh, to the point in questions and answers as possible. And uh, witnesses don't have to answer every question, but you may wish to come in on, on questions as themes develop. Uh, so first of all, we have um, from my left to right, Theresa Bray, Elizabeth Layton, and Janet Archibald. And perhaps each of the witnesses could simply tell us who they are and very briefly the organization they represent, what it does. I'm Theresa Bray, I'm the Chief Executive of ChangeWorks. We act, uh, we're an environmental charity delivering a range of services. Uh, we act as the managing agent for quite a number of the area-based schemes, working with the local authorities in the South East. We also deliver Home Energy Scotland, both in the South East Scotland and the Highlands and Islands, and part of the consortium that delivers Warmer Home Scotland. We're also specialists in behaviour change and really believe that you have got to integrate um, the technology with people that it's people who live in homes, who work in buildings, and we're not going to be able to just get a technological fix, but we've got to think about the people who work there as well. Hello, um, I'm Elizabeth Layton. I'm policy advisor with the Existing Homes Alliance, which is a coalition of housing, anti-poverty, environmental bodies, um, as, as well as business, working together to argue for greater investment and effort into improving the energy performance of our existing housing stock to achieve both the eradication of fuel poverty and meeting of our climate change targets. My name is Janet Archibald. I'm the energy engineer for Fife Council. I work on the non-domestic side of energy management, mainly looking at uh, delivering energy efficiency projects across schools, primary schools, nurseries, and care homes, leisure centres and the like. And I've that's been my main area of work over the last, over most of the time I've worked at the council, which is since 2008. Um, well, thank you very much to all of you for coming in today. Um, I would like to start with a question about current domestic energy efficiency schemes and also current business and public sector support. And just wondering if you had comments on what currently works well what aspects of existing schemes might benefit from change, and uh, also what challenges for these should be addressed by the um, draft energy strategy? Uh, I don't know who, who would like to perhaps start. Theresa Bray. Yeah. I, I th the, the government has had a lot of ambition with regard to energy efficiency and there's had a number of schemes over the years, whether it started as home uh, insulation scheme, and a lot of the easy hits have, have actually been achieved. Um, we are going on to sort of having to take a, a more challenging approach. I think one of the things that has worked well is, well, first the easy ones are getting lofts and cavities uh, insulated. And we are moving towards the more external wall insulation, which has been, though we talk about them being area-based, they've actually been at very small scale, but have worked well where we've had mixed tenure estates, sort of particularly your system-built estates, where there's been a lot of right to buy the combination of social housing with the private sector. Those area-based schemes have worked well, but they have only been tackling those who are probably more likely to be in fuel poverty. Our largest energy users are not those in fuel poverty. And if we're going to be meeting the climate change targets, we've got to be starting to engage with the, some might say it's the, the able to pay market, it's part, or maybe it's better to say it's, it's the not fuel poor, because obviously not everybody has got excess funds there. And how do we tackle that which is not really engaged with that? We've also had very much less engagement with the non-domestic sector. There has been progress in some of the, the public sector stock, but there's much less progress within the, the non-domestic private sector. Um, 
think one of the things is we really do need to start looking at a proper area-based approach to see how you can actually tackle, whether it's swathes of Edinburgh or, say, peoples down in the borders or areas like that, to see how you could get engaged everybody, both the fuel poor and the non-fuel poor, both the private um, sector businesses and the public sector, to see whether you can make those big differences. Elizabeth Layton. Sure, I'll, um, I'll build on that. Um, I think in terms of what's working well, Scotland's in the very fortunate position that we have a lot of you know, excellent building blocks in place for SEEP to, to be developed from. We have you know, the HEAPs, the Home Energy Efficiency Programs, are working relatively well. Um, we have a good blend of the local area-based schemes plus a national fuel poverty scheme to make sure that nobody is, you know, misses out from um, having their needs addressed if, if they're out with an area-based scheme. So that balance of local and national is good. Um, we have, a, uh, more recently, the Warmer Home Scotland program as seen as, as really a gold standard in terms of performance and providing quality assurance, but also delivering on other co-benefits such as local jobs in communities. And so that is seen as a, a model that can be built upon. We also have a very good um, nationally funded advice service um, with Home Energy Scotland. And again, you know, that can be built upon to incorporate some of the elements of behavior change, advice, and um, direct support to, to householders before and after um, measures are delivered. Um, in terms of challenges, uh, while we have those excellent building blocks, what we've been lacking is the long-term certainty of policy and funding for householders, for business, the energy efficiency and renewables industry, for, um, for government decision makers to, to know that you know, this is the plan and this is the plan going forward for you know, one, two decades. As in, but that is now indicated with SEEP. So if, we are, if the right policies are put in place along with long-term budgets, um, then that certainty can be provided and I think the market will respond and householders will respond. The other aspect that's missing is, is demand. You know, people don't want energy efficiency enough and you know, there are lots of reasons for that, but part of it is, is market failure, that the energy, the costs of energy aren't really, the social costs aren't incorporated in the price. So that needs to be over addressed by regulation and again, that's being consulted on as part of SEEP. Um, ad enhanced advice and information provision, as I've mentioned, and improved consumer protection. And again, that is something discussed in SEEP. So I think it's all, it's all there to play for, but it really depends on the leadership that we see from government right from the top with the First Minister and her cabinet saying, you know, this is one of our number one priorities for the next several governments. I can only speak on the non-domestic side. Um, I think the, the problems you've got are very, very challenging. Uh, I've done my best and to do as many projects as possible that are economic to do on the non-domestic side. Uh, going forward, we're going to have to start doing things that don't actually add up from a business case point of view, so we're going to need more money to be able to do them. Uh, and what you what you can actually make in terms of cuts to your energy, your carbon emissions uh, to a school, even if you do the lights and you do as much as you can on the heating side, you're still not going to get down to the targets that you you have set for yourselves. The barriers are not, are enormous. I think it's very um, not really addressed by what I've seen to date in, in um, everything that's been put for forward. Uh, in our case, we're looking at keeping our buildings wind and watertight and doing the essential maintenance and trying to clear maintenance backlogs. I have to compete against that when I'm looking to push energy efficiency. I've got to compete against roof repairs or doing extensions on buildings because there's more children in an area or that kind of thing. Um, the barriers that we have are things like asbestos, whether buildings listed or not. We have a lot of uh, buildings that don't have wet systems, 
that is that you can't that they're heated by direct, direct electric heating so you can't um, substitute other kinds of fuels unless you put in some kind of wet system into the building um, uh, the time scales you've got are very very challenging as, w as well uh, SEEP for doing the Pathfinder project we found that there wasn't enough time to um, get everything ready for the whole thing to be done in the time scale that was given. Uh, we need longer than one year to plan and execute projects. We have to have a longer time scale, like say two or three years, knowing what funding is going to be available. Um, uh, and, uh, and I speak uh, as someone who has tried to do as many projects as possible across the board, across our entire housing uh, non-portfolio stock. That is, um, for schools, for example, we've got 172 schools where we've done an energy audit, and we've got 175 buildings that are not schools where we've got an energy audit, and we've tried to do as many projects as we can across those um, buildings. Uh, we now have real challenges to go forward from here. Thank you very much. And I'll now come to a question from Richard Leonard. Uh, thanks, Condina, and uh, thanks to uh, each of you for making uh, very useful and in some cases quite provocative uh, submissions. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, to begin with, just a, a kind of very broad question, which is that um, the, uh, the dual uh, vision of the energy strategy appears to be, uh, one, demand reduction, uh, which you've spoken about already, uh, but also then the decarbonisation of the energy supply uh, base that we have. Do you think um, the government uh, is able to reconcile that with its continued um, pursuit of economic growth and its inclusive growth strategy? Elizabeth Layton. Okay, uh, uh, first, I'd like to say that with the energy strategy, we, re we really welcome that the, the energy strategy takes a whole system view, that it is looking at energy demand and energy generation together. I think there still is some way to go with changing the, the culture around our energy policy. When you, when you go to um, meetings about the energy st strategy, it still seems, you know, 75, 80 percent of it is still all about the generation side um, and growth and jobs and, and all related to that. But, you know, it's, it is a step towards that direction. Uh, in, in terms of of how it's reconciled with economic growth, that isn't something that we've commented on directly, but what I can say is that we're disappointed in the ambition for how much energy and heat demand is reduced over the course of, of SEEP and in the draft climate change plan. The expectation for the domestic sector is only for a 6% reduction in heat demand, and we think it should be much more ambitious in, in in reality, what they are predicting is a growth in the heat demand, and because there there will be a 15, they're projecting a 15% growth in heat demand, and yet only cutting, you know, nine nine percent off of that. And we believe there should be no growth at all, and indeed, a there needs to be a reduction over that period. Um, research that that we've called upon by AEA Ricardo. Um, suggests that there needs to be a reduction in heat demand of 30% across um, the building stock as part of the energy mix. You know, when we're talking about energy mix, it isn't just where the supply side, it's energy efficiency playing a part of that. And so in our response on the energy strategy, as well as with SEEP, we've called upon the government to spell out what they see the energy mix as going forward and what proportion energy efficiency needs to play to be meeting renewables targets, climate change targets, um, in order to make it affordable. Because after all, the cheapest form of energy is going to be the energy that we don't use. Um, the vast majority of um, energy efficiency projects are, um, have got a positive payback period, and so a very sound um, investment to, to be undertaking, both for individual households, if you look in the long term, and also for the, the private sector. I think part of that is that we do need to look and take longer term timescales to look at the issues um, because to get to those paybacks. If we also look at decarbonisation, uh, decarbonisation in the long term, we've got to find a solution. 
the majority of the buildings which we live in are, are going to be, still be there in, in 2050, and so we're going to have to deal with those buildings. The workplaces are going to be there. Unless we do start taking a planned approach and dealing with it now, we're going to hit major problems in the future. They're having a planned approach, sort of whether it's going to be uh, improving the energy efficiency of properties or also looking at alternative methods of heating, whether it's district heating or grid de uh, decarbonisation of the gas network. These will take a long time. Infrastructure projects do take a very long time. So for the economic stability in the long term, we've got to be start planning ahead. You asked whether it's consistent with growth. I would say that energy projects and energy efficiency work of all kinds are consistent with growth. I, f I feel that the projects that we've undertaken in Fife Council have been um, stimulating for the local economy because every time you do a lighting project or cavity wall insulation or any kind of project, you are um, you are actually stimulating a little bit of growth. Uh, it's whether it's local growth or whether it's perhaps coming from <laughs> Ireland or other places. Uh, when we've done a couple of biomass boilers, it's been Irish companies that have come in and done it. Um, but I still think that that's stimulating growth anyway. Uh, may, some of it may go back to Ireland, but some of it's going to remain where we are. Um, biomass projects, you want your fuel chip to come from a local source as much as you can. And we've we specified that we want as much local wood as possible. Um, so that wood has to be obviously uh, grown and harvested and chopped and prepared in the local environment. So that is consistent with um, economic activity in uh, the local area. Uh, where we're slightly short, uh, struggling is procurement opens up to the entire Europe, really. Um, if we could specify something could come a, a slightly shorter distance in some way, that would help. Um, I think you should be trying to reduce the de demand as much as you can before you're doing renewables. Uh, generation, renewable generation, it, that, that's a, a great thing. Uh, but it's you want to try and reduce the demand that you've got as much as you can before you start doing uh, generation of any kind. Um, sorry, I'm losing my place here. Um, Sorry, I've, I've lost my focus a little bit. Um, that, that's Sorry. all right. I, I don't know, Richard. Uh, and and, and we will, uh, uh, my colleagues uh, will ask questions uh, in due course about the supply chain, because I think that's an extremely important area, and, and one as an economy, jobs and fair work committee, we're especially, especially interested in. But I just wonder if I could um, uh, uh, take up um, something which was in the existing Homes Alliance uh, submission, uh, which is on a slightly different subject, but it's, it's about delivery, because I noticed that uh, in uh, the, uh, in the paper submitted, uh, it states that we believe there should be an independent body with the, with the remit for delivery of SEEP established through the Warm Homes Bill. So I wonder maybe, first of all, whether Elizabeth Layton could um, elaborate on that and what that would look like and if there are uh, equivalent bodies already existing in other areas of policy, uh, 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 what that would look like and in turn if uh, Theresa Bray and Janet Archibald from their perspective could comment upon whether that was a necessary uh, uh, vehicle that would that would that was needed to take this to the next level. Okay, yes, happy to, to speak on that point. Uh, this is something we've we've thought about f over the last last few months, and, and then in more detail once we've um, dealt in, in depth with the consultation, and and we've thought that to actually deliver this is such a massive infrastructure project, and rightly so. We are talking about our entire building stock and very ambitious changes that we foresee that, that need to happen for both you know, social and environmental reasons. And we can gain so much, but it's just not going to, and we've heard about some of the challenges already, it's not going to happen unless it is given the, the right profile, the leadership and the resources to deliver it. And we think it just, it isn't gonna happen by being on the edge of a few civil servants' desks. They're working hard, I don't, you know, I don't quibble with that, but it isn't, it isn't their A number one job that they have to do day in and day out. They have other responsibilities uh, and, and they, sh they have to keep within that, their, their portfolio. But once government sets the targets 
and you have the, the framework, the policies are set by government with input from, um, from the parliament, then we think it's the place for an independent body to deliver on that strategy and to report on that strategy. Because it, with such a project that's lasting over several administrations, we're talking up to you know, 20 years, 2038, that's a long time. Multi, you know, lo big budgets, the government has estimated 10 billion, but I think it'll probably be much more when you're talking about the entire housing stock. Possibly a role for regulation research, innovation, you know, there's, there's a host of issues there that it, that it entails. It's a good job to make, uh, a big job to make it effective. And we researched a little bit of what the National Audit Office has said, um, looking at examples of good infrastructure projects in the rest of the UK. And they found that as indeed having the ability to bring in skills and expertise to operate a bit more flexibly as a project develops, and changes over time through its project cycle, uh, that, that and having a very high level of reporting to the cabinet were all important factors for the success of projects like the Olympics. Um, we had something similar with Commonwealth Games. You'd say, well, those are events. You know, they they might be different, but they are. They were multi-year um, projects with with a project cycle of development through to um, achieving benefits after after the event. Um, and another example would be Transport Scotland. That was created to deliver big transport projects for the very reasons I have laid out, that you needed to have it separ separated from the day-to-day -day jobs of, of the civil servants. So we think the Warm Homes Bill provides an opportunity to create such a body. It could be similar to looking at international examples, something like the Danish Agent Energy Agency, which fulfills many of these functions. Um, so I think that is something that should be explored in depth um, over the next you know, months, looking at the SEEP consultation responses, um, and look at options for how it could be delivered uh, through, through an independent body. We haven't given it a name. I think that is something that could be explored, but we think it would be well worth it. Um. <clears throat> I very much agree that there is a need for an independent body that's out there, that it's both um, putting an awful lot of pressure on the civil servants who don't necessarily have the technical skills to be able to uh, see this through and provide the oversight, but also on local authorities. Local authorities have very, got a very key strategic role in actually understanding their areas, but the level of technical skills and expertise that uh, is expected of local authorities, especially in the cash strap times, and where you've uh, transferred the housing away from a local authority is putting a lot of pressures there. There are a lot of technical issues associated with refurbishing both our housing stock and the non-domestic sector there as, as well. And there's a need to ensure that we have the right standards set up, that, that we've got a uh, true understanding of the energy performance. We look at procurement, the, um, the, some of the contracts that have been proposed for Excel. They're looking at service contracts when we've got actually building contracts. We've seen what happens if you don't have strong managing agents taking place with areas such as the, um, the schools in Edinburgh, where there wasn't the control of those P PFI schemes. Quality is such a big issue. We've got to ensure that the standards are set there for quality, that the infrastructure is in place. There could be a lot of all of different methods of actually delivering, but setting those overall standards, we will need to ensure. Because if we make mistakes and we really impact on the performance of our housing stock, we're going to be living with that for decades. And what is that going to be as places to uh, live and make your home in? If we have um, do things wrong within the non-domestic sector as well, it's going to be in... Um, millions of different places we are making mistakes. We've got to ensure we get things right. And I think that can lead to us being too cautious at times. And if we don't provide the right support mechanisms to put in place to ensure that we're not reinventing the wheel, that we're sharing best practice, that we're ensuring that we consider the both the technological challenges but also the people living there. So that's overall guidance that's required. Yes, it may well be that local authorities are um, are involved in the actual delivering of it, but they need to be able to call on that level of support, or else we're setting people up to fail, and we shouldn't be doing that. Thinking about the uh, idea of an independent delivery body, I think it's um, worth uh, pursuing this uh, much further, because in the case of um, a local authority such as ourselves with uh, non-domestic building stock, stock and so on, uh, we have limited resources to be able to devote to energy, energy management or energy 
uh, efficiency projects. As I said earlier, they do compete with every other maintenance task that needs to be done with a school or a leisure centre. Um, the idea of the political, bo the, the delivery body, it would, uh, as Elizabeth said, it would be independent of the political cycle. Uh, we f I felt in, in Fife's case that there was a very great reluctance to, to commit to budget prior to the recent election because no councillors really wanted to, uh, you know, risk it before their election. And then you've only got, say, another four or five years, you're going to have another election. So the timescale of this grand project of reducing our emissions is way, way longer than any electoral uh, cycle, let alone ev any budget setting. Um, even if you did have an independent political bro uh, delivery body, you would still need quite a lot of uh, local authority resource. For example, if every time we need to do any kind of projects, we must have asbestos reports, we must have uh, drawings, we must have what is there already, somebody has to go and survey it. These are kinds of things, that, that, that very detailed things that we do whenever we do a project, is the delivery body going to do that? Or we, they may do a large amount of it, but they'll still need our resources to be able to, to do it properly. Um, the other thing that strikes me about the independent delivery body is that it would avoid this business of the number of local authorities and number of different bodies there are in Scotland, every one of them having their own little energy management team, some small ones, some bigger ones, but all taking a slightly different approach depending on the individuals involved in these particular uh, teams. Um, so you would get a very much of a patchwork quilt of effort. There would be a different amount of effort for each local authority depending on the political nature of that particular local authority. Uh, in Fife Council's case, We've been very lucky. We've been driven from the top, which says we will do this. But I can sense a change of direction. I can t sense that we will do this, except if it's going to impinge on our budgets for doing lots of other things that we need to do. Um, so I'm, I'm getting a, a feeling that we're going to have less money to be able to do things, but we've got a greater ambition to fulfil. And we also have the hard to do projects. We've done the best projects and the best paying projects. So if you had an independent delivery body, you wouldn't have this great split of all different people all trying to do, deliver this grand ambition in a slightly different way. The other thing about um, an independent delivery body, this is good and bad, is that when you get um, a different body that's doing it, you've got maybe a lack of ownership. You've got to be able to own the projects that need to be done. If you have too much distance, too many splits between delivering the project on the ground and, and actually who, who asks for the project. As you lose ownership of the project, you don't get so much buy-in for it. So you could get potentially more if you had an independent body, but you have to have enough strength for it to be able to do, to do it. Thank you. And now a question from John Mason. Hey, thanks, convener. I mean, I think following on from, from that previous line of thinking, if we are hoping to raise standards for buildings, um, the question is how we go about do how we go about that, and in particular, I suppose, for uh, existing buildings. And so I'm thinking both domestic and non-domestic. Um, how do we do this? Do we impose regulations and say that every time a building is sold, it's got to, to meet the standard, or there be a fine, or a tax incentive, or ju just that whole area of how do we take this forward? Not so much for the, where the public purse is paying the, the bills, but everybody else out there, uh, domestic, non-domestic. Any thoughts on that? Oh, Ms. Layton. Um. Yes, uh, the Alliance is, has long been a supporter of use of regulation to drive standards forward um, and to influence the market, to influence market transformation so that we as a society value energy efficiency more. And, you, and that would be, for example, that would be reflected in the property market. So, and that, that's already starting to occur, occur to some degree where you can get a premium 
for, say, an, an energy performance certificate, A or B rated property, and you'd get a, um, the opposite of premium, a deficit for one that's an F or a G. So that's, that's starting to happen, but I think regulation would really drive that. So we welcome the consultation that's out at the moment on regulation of the private rented sector, um, because we know that that's a problem. The, the lower rated houses are where fuel poverty is concentrated. And so for that reason alone, we should be acting to drive up standards in, in the private rented sector. But I think we should also be applying standards to the owner-occupied sector at a point of sale, as, as you mentioned. Um, and I understand the government is planning to consult on standards in the owner-occupied sector um, in the winter, I believe, is, is their commitment. And again, you know, we welcome that and we think it is absolutely essential to create that demand that I mentioned earlier, the demand f to make the SEAT program a success. A couple of things you've said. Um, mm -hmm. One, you mentioned the energy performance certificates. Are they the best measure? Are they fit for purpose? The energy performance certificate um, does have its have its issues, um, and but I think it, we need to be clear about you know are we talking about the the A to G scale? I think the banding is something that is easily communicated. People understand it. They they're used to it from um, its use with appliances, and it's it's been successful in other contexts at driving up standards and getting those worst performing products to either move up or be off the market. But the methodology that underpins the energy performance certificates, the standard assessment procedure um, that's used, um, does need improvement. And we've made several recommendations in our response about how, how it should be improved to better, um, to make it more accurate, um, to be more accurate in terms of you know, how your house performs, but also what measures should be installed. But I think we should be um, aware that it's about the theoretical energy performance of the building. It's not about the actual energy performance of the building. And so I think for a, it, it is, it can be used for regulation. It is proposed to be used for the, um, in the consultation on the private rented sector. Um, and what what the government has suggested is adapting the assessment slightly so that it makes a more bespoke um, proposal of what is the pathway, the least cost pathway for you to meet the minimum standard. Um, I can go, go into more be detail. enough for just now. That's I'll, enough I'll, for now, but <laughs> so, so to, yes, yes, it can be fine. used. Yes, it needs improvements, and I think okay. those improvements can be made. That's probably the main point. And the other point I wanted, you, you, you said there was a premium that if people do invest in the property, they're getting a higher price. I mean, does it actually match? So if I spend £5,000 improving my house, will I get £5,000 more when I sell it? Or how does that work? Um, well, I think the most important thing is that, that regulation should be done in a way that you're, you're better off, or at least, you know, at the very least, you're not worse off. And a lot of the, the improvements that we're talking about to get up to a minimum standard of E or even to a D are very simple insulation measures, hot water tank jackets, loft insulation. You know, it's not, not a big deal, really. They're, they're common sense measures where the payback is very good in two, three, four years' time. You're paid back, and then it's money in your pocket after that. I can't say how there have been various studies that have been done about how the property market is um, responding to the energy performance certificate ratings, but I, I can't say exactly how that would work in Scotland against the standards that are proposed, but you know, something, some research that could be done. Okay, right, apologies to the other two because yeah. I focused there on Miss Leighton, but I don't know if anyone has something else to say. Um, I think regulation is very much part of the suite of a um, delivery. You have to have both your, your carrots and your stick. And I don't th I think if there isn't regulation, we are not going to hit a significant proportion. And often those people, I think the private rented sector, it's correct that we're um, addressing those areas first, since those are often the worst um, properties. In terms of what will be the financial impact, once you've got regulation and people have to then sort the problems out, there will be a, a decrease in property values because you'll know that you'll have to sort the works. Currently, if you need to put in a damp co proof course or something like that, the mortgage lenders withhold funds. It will be reflected in the price when regulation comes along. 
I think you do have to start looking at the owner occupier sector because there's such changes there and actually encouraging people to think about their homes as somewhere that they've got to invest in, not just about putting in new kitchens and bathrooms, but making them profit homes that are going to be fit to live in throughout the lifetime of the occupants and regulation is an important part of that building regulations in the new build have made us improve the properties and since so much of our with our housing and business lots going to be there long term we need regulation to make sure it happens and Ms Archibald is it exactly the same for the non-domestic sector would you say that no I wouldn't say it is um, for schools schools are not sold they don't change hands there's no re reason to well, we have to have EPCs, but um, let, me, let me start by saying that the EPC regulation drove us to uh, make improvements. We had to find EPC, P, get EPCs for all our non-domestic buildings over certain floor areas. We chose to get energy audit reports at the same time as the EPCs because the surveyor would be on site, he would be able to write a report on what could be done to make improvements while he, while he was there. Um, as a result, we ended up with um, 279 energy audit reports. And out of that, we got 1,250 projects identified in those reports. Out of those, we found that 804 would pay back in less than 10 years. So from that, we further investigated 616 projects. And out of that, we've completed 306 projects. You get a rate of attrition. You start off looking at what's your overall stock. What, where, where are you? What can you do? So re regulations drove all that. Having said that, Fully half, mo most of our property is in a G. Okay, so we're talking nearly half of it, and that's nearly 200 metres, 200,000 metres squared of property being a G rated. If we take an F as well, that's 50% of our non domestic stock for which we've got energy performance certificates. If you take um, everything that we've got to E, that's nearly three quarters of our property. If we were to improve to nearly D, we would only have about a quarter of our stock which would actually meet the, the um, regulations. Now, law that says you've got to get everything up to D. I mean, yes, in a sense, three quarters of our buildings well, would be right, not so there, conforming. To there'd be a huge financial impact. A huge financial impact. But, but it would strengthen your case when you're competing with the roof repairs that you were talking about earlier. Exactly. If you make something law, you make something happen. If you're talking asbestos regulations or legionnaire's disease or gas safety regulations or anything along those lines. If it is the law, then we have to find the money for it. The money has to be found. The question is, where is the money going to come from? It, not, it can't necessarily come from the local authority because we're trying to keep the roof over the buildings. You know, It could possibly come from government, but that's taxpayers. I, I did read through all, the, all of the stuff and I, I did notice the, the, the um, equity bonds or something like that. Pension funds, to me, would be a very good way because we're talking very long-term projects. You need very long-term investors. You know, It's a bit like investing in forestry or something. You get your reward in 40 years' time. In the case of energy efficiency, it's going to be a long, long process to get your money back. A lot of money needed up front. To give you another scale of the task, if you take the 19 high schools, five of our high schools are actually electrically heated with underfloor heating. And the underfloor heating is actually nearly four, over 40 years old. It's like coming to the end of its life. Now, we can't build another five high schools just, um, and just knock these ones down. And it turns out that these five high schools are also kind of 60s built. They're not very well insulated. They're um, full of asbestos. One of them's 
electrically heated, full of asbestos and listed. I think, <laughs> we're, we're, I think we're raising more issues than getting answers, but I think that's, but, that's but very... seriously, we have got no, a big... It's it a is huge very scale. helpful. No, it is very helpful what you've yeah. been saying, but I think I'll hand back to the convener at this point. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we'll move on to a slightly different area, and uh, Gordon MacDonald has a question. Just before we move on, I was wanting to ask a quick question about uh, non-domestic buildings from Janet Archibald. Um, in your submission, you said that thousands of new buildings are using double the energy that they should because developers are massively overestimating their efficiency. And you went on to say, we believe that there may also be a need for punitive measures to penalise developers and designers who deliberately overstate the future performance of a building. Now, we're talking about, at the moment, about um, trying to uh, resolve the problems relating to existing stock, but, you know, do we have a major problem moving forward with new buildings that are putting up? Yes. <laughs> so how do we resolve that? We... Um I'm not sure it's deliberate um, overestimation. I think you, you, you start with this theoretical model. You put in your drawing, all the dimensions of your, of your building. You attribute properties to all of the walls, the floors, the ceilings. You put in your systems. You do your very best to get the right, out, the right answers out as to what the building will do and how it will perform. It's not necessarily deliberate that it doesn't then do that. Um, we demolished one of our schools and built another school in its place. Uh, the school that we put up in its place is A rated. It's A plus. Its performance is not A plus. It's not A, a rated. Um, it's, it's it's really difficult, you know, um, and it's not necessarily deliberate. If I can just find it here, uh, I may not be able to find it, but. Uh, it, it can take quite a long time to get a building to perform the way you want it to perform. Uh, the first year, it probably will be about the same performance as the one that you knocked down. It takes maybe two or three years to get it more tuned into the way it should perform. Even then, it may, not perf it may never perform as well as a theoretical model. It, it does take a long time to calibrate these models and make sure they match reality. So that is a major problem, but it's not necessarily deliberate. I mean, I have the same task. When I'm doing a project in a building, say, putting in new lighting or cavity wall, I will do all the th calculations in theory, and I'll come up with a saving. And I'll say, right, there's a cost saving, there's a cost, there's a cost saving, that's the payback. But will it actually happen in reality? It's very difficult to say. If it'll actually result, you'll get exactly what you want in reality. You may not. And it may not, not be anything deliberate. I don't mean to interrupt. I just wanted to say that, witnesses, there may be things that we don't have time to cover in this session. And if you want to submit further comment in writing and add a bit of detail, that yeah. that would be helpful for the committee. But um, if there are things like that, then you, that's a way to deal with things, I think. So perhaps Gordon MacDonald uh, yeah, will come on to this the further yeah. question. Yeah, my, my questions were in relation to funding round seeps. And... Um, we know that since 2008 there's been a substantial amount of investing into domestic housing and that 49% of social housing is banned or above, but only a third of private dwellings is at the required level. So given that a large proportion of housing is private housing and there is this lag behind social housing, what's needed to encourage private investment in this area to ensure there's a greater take-up of um, home and um, home insulation and products. I'll, I'll start on that. Thanks for the question because I think that is you know just in those statistics of themselves speak volumes about the value of regulation and the role it can play. Because since the social sector has been regulated, this is the result they get. They have much higher quality homes than in the private sector. We can the same can happen in the private sector if if we introduce. Uh, regulation, and I should say that a lot of that, or the bulk of those improvements, have been done through either the local authorities or the housing association providers, and the tenants themselves have been paying for those improvements. That hasn't been, you know, just all paid by the public sector. That's been paid by them. 
uh, and that brought that investment into the social sector. So it's, reg it's regulation again, and it's, it's also about um, behaviors, I'd say as well, because the social housing um, providers have worked quite har hard with their tenants so that they understand how some of these new systems work and get, get the most out of them. So they're, they're winning the benefits as well as um, just getting the standard. You, you, men you mentioned behaviour. Um, we are aware that there is um, a saving can be made if people switch electricity users, but still a large proportion of people stick with the traditional electricity you know, supplier that they've used for many, many years. And given that many households simply can't afford to make short-term expenditure for some kind of long-term saving, um, you know, what has to be in place to try and encourage people to make these investments? I think that um, obviously regulation is the backstop there for, for changing behaviours, but you've also looked, got to look to see how you can facilitate um, people uh, undertaking energy efficiency measures. It is a challenge getting any works done in your home or for any business getting any works done and it's how can that be made easy for um, businesses. They've got to be confident that the, um, they've got to have something to, to say that they're these trusted traders that they can use, they, can, they often want to be able to call upon uh, quality assurance to be able to assure the work's been done. I think one of the major issues is some of the schemes which were run previously, particularly the ones funded under the energy company obligations. The level of quality assurance with one local authority, we've seen that 50% of the cavities that have notionally been filled have either not been filled, just holes drilled, or that they are only partially filled because you had unskilled tradesmen. We've got to look at skilling up our workforce because there are not sufficient people in Scotland trained up to do that. A lot of the traditional work people could um, actually be adapt their skills to do that, but there's just not enough joiners and plasterers and the like to actually undertake that task um, carried out. So we've got to look at having the skills there. And you've got to get that community engagement involvement. Some of the regeneration that has taken place when the some of the area-based schemes, which have often been concentrated more fuel people, you see the external cladding that's taken place of properties and the pride that people get in living in those properties. External wall insulation is not appropriate for an awful lot of the stock, but it is appropriate for certain sectors. And if to make that happen, you have to organise that. It's a building, uh, a lot, uh, medium-sized building project has got to be managed well, the quality assurance and ensuring that the standards are met. But it's quite interesting about, you mentioned about switching we look, actually, for a lot of people, the money involved in switching is sort of, it can be good at one-off, but actually to keep switching each year, it's only a relatively small amount of money. Switching on the whole doesn't make anybody use any less energy. Most people don't know how much energy they use. They don't know if their fuel bill, they know whether they find their fuel bill is difficult to pay, but they don't know whether compared to their neighbours or to the other localities, do I have a high fuel bill or a low fuel bill? So they're not actually got that awareness. And what support mechanism, what behaviour change programmes do you have to put in so you part start paying that attention? Because we do have to look about reducing our carbon emissions to get people involved. And how do we get that um, in interest in doing that, which is a challenge. And I think that full area-based schemes have got a role. There could be things about one of the issues is that we there's not huge amounts of promotion, though we have some excellent programmes like Warm Home Scotland. Because actually the demand is so high, we're not promoting that to the full extent that we should be doing. It's uh, because there's, there, if we promoted it and so many people knew it was there, you wouldn't be able to meet the demand with the budgets that are currently available. Um, so there's a lot of things that there can be interest if you look to promote it, but you've got to think how you fund it. Grants are applicable for those who actually need it, but there is a need about for loan finance to make that easier, for people to ha actually have other facilities there. How do you get the mortgage industry in? Because you've got a very well-established lending market for the bands. And for businesses, is a big challenge as well, because they make such short-term decision-making. Businesses often make much shorter-term decision-making um, uh, paths that they're not prepared to invest in anything. It doesn't give them a six-month return. You will need regulation to make the businesses consider that. You, you talked about external cladding um, in relation to flats and tenements. What, what role do you think the, council, the local authority, the council should have? I mean, I'm aware in Edinburgh that uh, in relation to repairs, the council steps back from intervening if there is at least one private tenant uh, in the building um, and leaves it up to the um, combination of tenants and owner-occupiers to try and make that arrangement. 
which had given the extent of the, the problem that we've got with external cladding and, and the nature of the job would make it quite difficult for an individual to try and organise. So what should the role of local authorities be in this? I think the local authorities definitely have got a strategic role that they've got to play. And if we are going to be having these programmes, which is you're going to be having possibly a, a SEEP um, de delivery there, there needs to be there to, to actually be able to um, ensure that they're supporting the programme there. I think one of the things about SEEP, they do envisage local authorities having a key role. Um, I think it's going to be impossible for just getting people without an external body to actually organise themselves to actually carry out work that's done. In Edinburgh, yes, they are, some of the middle class areas are sorting out their roofing problems, but it's not. Go it's very challenging if you've got to try and get 10 people to agree to carry out some works. There's got to be a facilitation there. Yes, it could be done by the local authority. You often have to have, if you start looking at the Tenements Act and the Warm Homes Bill that's coming along, how can you make that happen? Um, there's got, in Glasgow, you're in a different situation. You've got factors there. That, there are some disadvantages of that, but there are people taking a lead in that. Um, you can't expect things in a multi only occupied bill to happen without some sort of external party to facilitate it. And, and just getting back to the funding question, the uh, equity loan scheme that was introduced recently, is that going to provide all the necessary funding to encourage people to uh, make these improvements? Um, okay. um, the equity loan scheme is, is one of several offers that are on the table at the moment, and and we did welcome that 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 was provided because it because it's good for people that may not have the cash or with, um, to to pay for the upfront capital for measures, uh, and and we think that is going to have to be the case with this mixture of carrots and and sticks is that you will need a, a range of incentives, some providing you know loans to to cover the upfront costs, some per perhaps incentives, tax incentives, that are rebates that are paid after the measures are completed. So to suit people's different circumstances, um, or you know how they um, how they like to want to play pay for those those measures. Um, but what one thing that we've called for that in the design of SEEP that we should be evaluating the many years of experience that we have with loan schemes, starting back with a home renewables loan several years ago. Um, and to my knowledge, there hasn't been a review of an, an Energy Saving Trust has delivered these loans on behalf of the Scottish government. And there hasn't been a comprehensive look at you know, what's worked, why, what are the particularly successful triggers, how have they been marketed, you know, why have people not followed through once they've made an inquiry? All those questions would be so valuable in designing these incentives going forward. Thank you. We'll move now to a question from Bill Bowman. Oh, thank you, convener. If I can move to the area of advice and information that's available for the various consumers, and perhaps some of this has been touched on slightly before, because I think you mentioned that the the government currently has advice available through the Home, en Home Energy Scotland, Resource Efficient Scotland. And it's been um, recognised by the government that before their cons consultation, there needs to be um, effective advice and information mechanisms available to um, consumers and whether it's individuals or businesses to make informed decisions basically about the energy uh, efficiency and supply in the future. They also consider that there would be a value in having a trusted source of advice so that inf um, awareness could be raised about what is available. Now, do you think that the energy strategy and the SEEP consultations adequately address the need for a meaningful public engagement and effective behaviour change? Behaviour change is something we've um, asked about before because there's been a sort of a slight feeling that you can do your models, you can work out the outcomes, you can decide you want to change a variable. But when it comes down to persuading people that they have to throw away their gas boiler or you're going to penalise them if they want to sell their house or stop them selling their house, how do you get people like that on site in a practical way? Um, it, it is a big challenge. I think that often that... Um, People are time poor often. They've got other priorities in their life, something that so many areas we've got, um, uh, we are looking at um, 
the, that how do you balance out those priorities? A lot of the things we have are actually quite challenging. It's sort of if you ask people to go around a room, how do you actually adjust your heating system? The majority of people have got a vague idea about how to do it, but they're they're not very certain about what to do. And that's one of the difficulties. We've got a myriad of things. You get given a little manual that suddenly I can't find my glasses to ever read it. You've got to find better ways of engaging people. That if you look about behavioural change science, sort of one of the programmes which we've been running is it's not just telling people. People don't want just information. People they need to be supported into undertaking their exercise. They need to try to say you could try an experiment to adjust your radiators. You can change it back again. Why don't you today do it? It does take time and resources. Sometimes it's much easier to think we're just going to slap some materials on the outside of a building. But it's people you've got to engage it. You look at the issues about how do you work in an office. You've got the people who like it hot, people who like it cold, all those sorts of things. But you can carry out exercises to get people involved in engaging it. How do they have that can sometimes involve moving people around, but it's actually accepting that they don't have the information to know, well, actually, this, this office is quite warm. It's 22 degrees, which is a very acceptable change, but I'm just feeling a bit cold. Um, perhaps you need to put a card in. But you do have to have those engagement programmes put in place them developed and actually supported for the implementation to take place. It will require resources for that to take place. Um, but most people don't want to be actually wasting money. If you were to reduce the arguments in an office place about the temperature of buildings, you'd actually probably increase work productivity. There's so many people have issues there. How can you do that? And we are looking at sort of certainly within change groups, we are having those exercises. There are a lot of things you've had within recycling, say, in the Parliament. A lot of work has gone into that to make you actually change your behaviours. There's a science there, the people are specialists in there. It's a programme that's got to be supported. So I think that, that there, there is work that can be done, provided that that investment takes place. You then start talking about sort of the wider provision of advice. I think that a lot of the time we're focused on providing information. And information is different from providing advice. You're, you can provide people with a lot of information, but you then have to provide guidance about what are your circumstances. This may well be the best route for you to do. And be prepared to move beyond the provision of information. We've also got to look to see that people are... are getting information and advice and support in different ways. That, yes, there are a lot of people who like uh, engaging still on the telephone, but a lot of the people, and particularly the high-energy users, are not people who are going to ring up a helpline to find out it. They want to be able to do things digitally to find resources to actually take place. We've got to look to see how our systems evolve, that we mustn't leave people behind, those people who still need in-depth and face-to-face -face support and telephones, but there's a spectrum of support that is required. But I think it is support to take action and not just the provision of information. Yes, if I can add to that, um, I think a part of this will be about engaging the, the wider public, you know, businesses as, as people in their workplace, but also in their homes, with, with the vision for 2050. You know, how marvelous is that going to be when we're living in zero carbon homes, when we have virtually, you know, very small energy bills when we're actually generating electricity electricity power from our homes you know it, we have to engage people with that very exciting very positive very desirable vision if any of you have ever been in a in a passive house and experienced the comfort and have been told oh you know we we don't pay any energy bills and my house never loses any temperature overnight or I've been away for the weekend and it's still just as warm as it was when I left. You know, that that is the future for that that we should be aspiring to and is the vision and the strategy. So it's engaging everyone with that that vision. That's that is number one. So that people are want that. And they're they're, you know, knocking the door saying, how can I have it? You know, I, I want that. And then and then you can provide the advice. And, and it needs to be, as Teresa was saying, it needs to be people-centered. It can't be a measures-based program. It can't, you know, it can't be a knock on the door saying, we've got solid wall insulation for you. And you say, well, actually, that wasn't what I was interested in. I want to have a warmer, more comfortable home with affordable bills. You know, and, and so tailored solutions. Again, that's, it's more of an upfront investment, but I think we know that that's how we're going to get the results in the longer term. If people are engaged, if they feel they're getting good quality, fair, independent advice, and there are these enabling measures put in, you know, make it easy for people, make it easy for them to do it voluntarily, make it easy for them to comply with regulation. It shouldn't be seen as a penalty. This is all about helping you to save, to save energy. 
I would like to give you some context. I was uh, involved in um, one of the SEEP projects, which was a business centre in Dunfermline, and I needed to uh, put in some sensors so that they, we could monitor how well a project was going to go for their particular business centre where we were trying to adjust them from having electric heating to biomass heating. And so I had to engage in various business, engage various business owners through the centre. Um, a podiatrist really wasn't all that interested. He wanted to go from one appointment to the next appointment, and he didn't want to spend any time with me. But I managed to put the stuff in. Uh, another guy, very similar. The picture framer guy was really, really not interested in speaking to me at all. I started to put the measure in, and something went wrong with his computer. He blamed me and ripped everything out, and I had to leave hastily. <laughs> then I saw him chatting away with another business owner over a fag, and he was talking about, oh, how this stupid woman had come round, and I thought, oh, my goodness, so it's awful. If you've got a business owner who's time poor, they're not really interested in energy efficiency. They're interested in whether they can pay their bills and get their business to work. Second context, I come home each day and three days out of five, I have a message on my answer phone trying to sell me a gas, uh, uh, trying to replace my gas boiler or sell me some kind of energy efficiency thing. And they tell me it's part of the green deal. And every day, it's delete, delete, delete. I am not interested. Even though I'm actually an energy engineer, um, we need to have people buy in and not be sold. They don't want the hard sell. Nobody wants a hard sell. Nobody wants something on their answer phone. You have to have buy in. Uh, we had a, a campaign locally where we tried to get people to engage in buying a piece of land for community ownership. They had a community engagement in the church hall. That did work. People did arrive. People did talk about it. I think you have to have face to face. You have to have people voting with their feet and coming along, getting people to come along and buy in. Nobody wants a hard sell. That's my comment. Um, the other thing is, in the Fife context, we're not in a city, so we don't have lots of neighbours nearby, so we can't have like a, a tight little district heating scheme or a campus-based thing. Neither are we in uh, the remote sticks where we're off-grid and it's very expensive alternative energy. We've got low gas prices. We have to make our schemes stack up with very low, cheap energy. So for us to save energy, we're already not paying huge amounts of energy if we're on a gas system. So you have to think about it in that context as well. Thank you. Just, I think what you're saying is we're talking the talk, but we're not yet walking the walk on behaviour change. Um, and, and a brief follow-up from Dean Lockhart. Th thank you, Convener. Just to follow up on uh, behavioural change and education, given that today's school leavers by 2030 will hopefully be home occupiers or homeowners, um, what role does formal education play in this? Is there a, um, a possibility that we can start educating kids at, who are about to leave school or at some point about this uh, so that when they are in the future, or they could even talk to their parents, perhaps, in the future they're in a position that they fully understand some of these issues. I think that Fife has done a lot of um, in-school e energy education with young children. I see it as a very, very long-term energy efficiency project. You're going to get your, you're going to pay the money now to 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 do that, but you're not going to get your buy. You're not going to get the effect for 20 years or so before they can grow up and actually buy an energy efficient home. So it is a good thing, but it competes against every other kind of energy efficiency project that we could do. Uh, an interesting uh, thought on that and linking it to the discussion about regulation earlier, that these young people will be renters, most likely. Um, and at the moment, I'd say they have very little agency in being able to say, to get a more energy efficient um, pro property to rent. Probably they're going to end up in a, a quite poor um, energy efficiency property. And it's, and it's hard for them to find out the information. 
Uh, it's, it's now energy performance certificate ratings will be included in tenant information packs, but they often feel um, because they're short-term rentals or there aren't many properties available, then they're, they're not exactly shopping around. So this is where regulation can actually tie in with if they have increased knowledge and they can be asking questions and actually demanding that, well, you know, you're not up to, up to standard and I, that's my right to have a more energy efficient property. And so I think working with, like say, National Union of Students and others to raise their awareness as well as bodies like Shelter and others so that when regulation comes in, it's actually enforced and makes a difference will be very important. Okay, we will now move to a question from Gillian Martin. I want to come back to something that's been touched on by a couple of you in round about the question, and particularly from, from Richard Lennon, about jobs and the opportunities for job creation and economic development. It seems to be two things that come out for me that there's, this is a, going to be a massive un undertaking to, to achieve the goals set out. And there's great potential for um, job creation and great potential for existing companies to take advantage of of the work that's out there. But you also mentioned we've got a skills shortage already. And I'd just like to open that up further and get your views on that. How, what should we be doing now to ensure that companies can take advantage of the opportunities out there? And what should we be doing now in terms of upskilling our workforce to be able to, to carry out all this work? Yeah. I think uh, we currently got two models of uh, delivery of energy efficiency programmes in the domestic sector. One being the area-based schemes where you're going through large-scale procurement, for the, which are very short-term, the individual contracts there, and there are actually only four companies that bid for these contracts that are large enough to do so, are prepared to take the risk of taking on a, a short-term contract. They do struggle to get the, the staff to do that. There's a lot of subcontracting take place. There's a lot of... Um, um, Skills, skilled workforce coming from, from different parts of Europe to actually deliver that. On the uh, fuel poverty programme on Warmer Home Scotland, that's delivered by Warmworks, we've got a seven-year contract there with very clear guidelines set about the need to ensure that you're getting that wider community benefit there. There you've got 30 local subcontractors working from Shetland down to the borders, um, the, delivering the program, you've got certainty that it's worthwhile the smaller companies getting involved in that delivery because it is a long-term contract for them. They are going to be taking on apprentices <laughs> to be able to deliver that. There's a certain amount of work that's coming through. It's the stop and start nature of the and the short-term funding that's been associated with a lot of the initial program that is preventing new players coming to the market or the existing companies actually training up and moving into the market and making it worthwhile. You've also got to look at the terms of procurement as well. There's a very big difference. If you have the huge contracts, you'll only get very big companies who can go through the framework. If you start looking at delivering things on a much smaller scale, and yes, you need to, to have suitable standards in place and ensuring value for money, but there are different frameworks that can be developed, particularly if the contractual arrangement is not between um, the public sector. It's different for someone at schools, but if you've got small non-domestic firms or, or the private housing and an individual company, then you can have different frameworks set up there to ensure you've got the quality control, the, the comfort that's provided for um, the consumer, but you don't necessarily have to have the huge contractual framework. And one of the issues is that because the contractual framework that it goes there, you actually can't ensure that a lot of the um, services that you're, the standards that you require are part of that. So it's thinking about the procurement framework, the length of funding that is taking place. But despite that, you've got to have the people you're going to be skilling up to actually work in that area. And you're both looking about what is the role of the local colleges, what is the place of both its young people leaving school, but also people retraining as well. And that has got to be more focused on that, tying the two together. How can you actually develop those skills? Because when you're working in um, existing stock, there, there will be a role for technological fixes, and that you will find better ways to do it, so you can have some off-site um, uh, works taking place that you can just try and ship in, but you do have to have those skilled crafts people actually doing the work often in sight because you've got to adjust the sizes of things as well. But you've got to be prepared to have that long-term investment. So people say it that it is a career there and the investment takes place and that combination of the, the colleges and procurement and the, the companies there uh, and the, making sure that the local companies are interested, but most of them are not short of work. So if anything's seen as difficult to work in, they will go and look elsewhere. 
Um, just to add to that, that I think the other elements, if you, if you ask industry what they, what they need, is, is one, it's the certainty that there will be the resources, the budget for the program, and also the, the target. You know, what, what are we trying to achieve by in 20 years and the milestones along the way? So they know what's going to be expected of them as an industry. Um, and then alongside the certainty is, as Teresa was saying, some, a skills development strategy. And I'd, I'd say, you know, another role for the independent body to, to work with industry on, on that. And my last point is to say, you know, we've been talking about SEEP for two years. This was first announced, the National Infrastructure Priority, in June 2015. It's May now. The consultation is just concluded, but one might say that that consultation, a lot of the questions that we're talking about, we could have had that conversation two years ago. Uh, and that's an example of, of why we need to, you know, the skills development work could have started then. You know, what are, what are we waiting for? And, and hence, again, perhaps another rationale for that delivery body is is to deliver the pace and scale that we need to achieve the ambitions. I think if the demand is there, you will, the, the skills will follow. Um, if you can, uh, if you create a, a program of work, say in lighting or, or whatever, and you you know that it's going to go on for a long period of time, the skills can be developed for that. But if you've only got one year, it's not long enough. Um, we do have a direct labour organisation at Fife Council that has done a lot of my um, energy efficiency projects like lighting and so on. But the problem is we have to have match funding as well uh, for the SEEP thing, we have to have match funding. But the other thing is that we could use your newly developed non-domestic energy efficiency framework which uh, the Scottish Government have set up. My problem with that is it's got to be £1 million and upwards. I would prefer to have much smaller lots than that for doing energy efficiency work. And if it was very much smaller lots, you could get much more small, much smaller companies and they would go into it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Now a question from Ash Denham. Thank you, convener. Um, so we've already touched on a bit during the discussion about the you know, important role that local authorities would have in delivering SEEP. So I'm just wondering about what your views are on um, these area-based schemes and how they stack up compared to those that are targeted at either sectors or tenures? We've got to cover all of Scotland. And if you start just looking at particular individual sectors, you're going to have to keep coming back to an area. You're likely to sort of pick off the, 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 the easy wins first. Um, but if we've got to cover all of Scotland, because energy is used throughout Scotland, actually having an area-based approach would do that. You, there are things that you want to learn from one, one working with one sector to another sector if you're, say, you're working with the hospitality industry, which is a very dispersed sector. Again, there are things you'll learn from one area that you want, need to ensure that that best practice of working with the, the hospitality sector can be used in other areas. Um, to actually get that um, interest to actually want to take part in something is going to be much more difficult if you're having a very dispersed nature. There, may, there could well be some sort of, I think that's going to be a combination of the two because there are specific things that you're going to do, be doing, say, in uh, what you have to do in hospitals is probably more transferable. We've, we've got a limited number of hospitals. Actually looking to see how you deal with hospitals as a whole is probably going to make sense. But an awful lot of things is that much smaller businesses, smaller areas there that you need to combine both the domestic and non-domestic. And it also allows your, your local contractors to be developed as well. Because, uh, yes, working in um, large projects in a hospital, sort of big projects there, it's likely to be the larger contractors. But uh, if you want to work within an area, you want to get those small contractors involved, and that community buzz, the community engagement that you will get through working in, in an area. But there is the difficulty if that you're working in areas, if it's going to be a 15-year programme, there's some, or 20-year programme, there'll be some areas you're not going to get to for 20 years. And you've got to think, how do you deal with those people who are in fuel poverty who cannot wait for, for their homes to be, be made more energy efficient or have more efficient housing? There's got to be a national programme to deal with those who are, are most in need. There will also be early adopters who you're going to want to encourage to, to take action as well. So I think to cover all of Scotland, you need to have area-based ones, but you must ensure that you facilitate the different demographics of those most in fuel poverty that you deal with as their need arises, and also to support the early adopters. 
if ever you're going to do district heating, you've got to do it on an area base as well. You can't have sort of, it, it won't work if you don't have everybody engaged, both the domestic and the non-domestic in that. For uh, area-based um, work, our asset management team have been going through our non-domestic por portfolio looking for redundant buildings or buildings that are partially used, say, for example, in Kirkcaldy, there might be quite a number of community centres, and it's a case of, well, do we need them all, and could we close some? So we are starting to look at things in an area base for other types of activity apart from energy efficiency. Um, it probably would. Uh, this is one of the things I have problems with that when I'm doing energy efficiency work, which is not in schools. Yeah. I have to work out whether we're going to keep the building or not. Is it going to be retained before we improve it? Now a question from Jackie Bailey. Uh, I'm increasingly persuaded by the argument for a national body, um, but I, I do want to explore with you um, where responsibility should lie in the balance between local and national responsibility, because it's all very well for you know national um, government to set targets and leave it to local government to deliver against those responsibilities. Is there a, a view that perhaps some local target setting would also be appropriate? So I'm just keen to explore that with you. Um, I'll, I'll take that one. Uh, what, what we see is that it's, it, it's a national body, but it's not doing all the work, obviously. It's, there's a balance between the national and local actually delivery on the ground. Uh, with uh, local targets, we think there would be local target setting as is envisioned with the local heat and energy efficiency s strategies. And I would say also that we'll need to bring in the fuel poverty strategies that local authorities or local fuel poverty groups would, would be forming as well. Um, but there needs to be some kind of oversight to make sure that those local targets add up across the piece to meet the national target. And, th and that would be a role for your national body. Uh, and and some kind of reporting reporting against that. But at the same time, some local authorities will be able to deliver more than others because some have more challenges, some have other opportunities where they can make greater progress faster. Others, it might take longer. And there should be allowed some flexibility for local approaches. And, and indeed, that would be advantage to, to have a bit of variety of, of approaches so that we can learn from those. So... Yes, a, the responsibility would be shared, but you would have a, na a national body that, that would have oversight. And then I think, as Teresa said earlier, could actually take some of the load off of local authorities in terms of the standard setting, perhaps in terms of providing support on regulation um, so that we have more consistent application of reg uh, enforcement across the piece, um, uh, data collect data collection, mapping, data sets, all, you know, could be shared and therefore save, save money for everyone. Well, one of the concerns, if I can just pursue this point of, of kind of setting up a different body or an arm's length body, is then accountability to Parliament um, and the setting of budgets. And I wonder whether you would comment on that, because um, I could see how it would work, but, but you are pushing away to a distance that direct accountability. So how would you lock that down? I think there would have to be reporting and scrutiny arrangements set when it was established, and that's why we've suggested it would be established through the Warm Homes Bill, mm -hmm. and and that you would have regular reporting to Parliament that it would have to that it would be accountable to. But ultimately, the the target setting, the, you know, the vision for CEP has to be at the ministerial level. I, I would see that. Um the report, the reporting aspect of it is actually very onerous. Um, for, for us, because we're not doing like a hundred homes here or, or, or whatever, we're doing individual buildings. The amount of bureaucracy involved in something like SEEP or any of the national schemes, I have to sort of say, well, how much it's going to cost, how much it's going to save, right up front, when these things are actually quite uncertain. I find that we, we start off with a great deal of uncertainty in the cost and the scope of any particular individual project in a building. Uh, we home in on it as we actually get closer and closer to implementing it. Even once we've implemented it, we sometimes find there's a difference in cost between before when we started and we ordered the project to go ahead and when it's actually delivered. If we have our rounds of reporting, 
it gets to be very, very bureaucratic to the point that Fife Council might say, do we really want to go with SEEP at all? It's so top heavy with the amount of, the number of layers of reporting, if it's going all the way up to Parliament, it's a lot to put on an individual like myself. Um, certainly it was for the SEEP Pathfinder projects. I've had to report to internal people within the council and external people as well, all for very small projects. What, well, what are really quite small projects in individual buildings? Thank you. And finally, a question from Andy Whiteman. Thank you, Convener. Um, the energy strategy also includes a, a goal of setting a target of 50% of Scotland's all energy needs from heat and transport and electricity from renewable sources. Um, I mean, this is not your specialist area, I don't think, but do you have any comment on how feasible that will be, given that it's um, intended to achieve it in a little over 10 years by 2030? Comment that the existing homes alliance we've supported the setting of that target because you know in, in large part because it does talk about heat we're no longer just talking about electricity and we think we do need obviously need to talk about heat it's not something we've really discussed today um, but I think it is one of the biggest challenges for SEEP and for the energy strategy obviously is to is to deal with decarbonizing of heat um, and so I'm, I'm not really commenting on the achievability across the board, but in terms of the domestic sector, yes, you know, certainly very challenging, but at the same time, I think it is, it is a direction that we have to go in if we are serious about addressing the climate change targets. I think it's also equally important to make sure that when we're changing heat, you know, from fossil fuel heat to decarbonized heat, that it isn't more expensive, that we're not increasing a fuel poverty problem um, because after all you know we still have to pay pay for the heat and so that's why we've called for more effort to be put on fabric efficiency in the early years of the SEEP program and then it's you're reducing the heat demand and so you you don't have such a burden on creating even more decarbonized heat and you're reducing the costs so more of an effort fabric energy efficiency as well as um, looking at heat pumps and, you know, really a focus on off-gas grid areas. I think in the early years is something we can do now. We know what the solutions are. Um, there's a good track record. So, you know, let's get on with it. There, there certainly is. It's very ambitious, the targets that set there. But, but it could be achievable if the political will is there and you start having the regulatory requirements behind it as well. We saw the gas network was being put in and installed, retrofitted to all the housing and businesses there. And the majority of properties are now 80% of the domestic stock is heated by gas, but they weren't built with, with gas central heating to a large extent. Lots of the systems that you've got in place already, yes, you may have to change to have a, instead of having a, a gas boiler, you could, if you've got a district heating system, you'd have to have a heat exchanger. It could be done, but we don't have any of the mechanisms to make it happen at the moment. What is happening in district heating in Scotland is way behind what's happening in other parts of both Europe and uh, England as well. We don't, um, it's not standard practice whenever you dig up the road that you're putting in heat pipes. You could be doing that. You could be insisting that new developments all have the, even if you're not initially going to be connecting them to a district heating system, at that time, if you built them there with the opportunity to have a heat network there, it would significantly reduce the cost there. It, there's a possibility it might not be used, but the, the actual um, regret for not doing that is much less if you put it in whenever you're doing planning that infrastructure bonds there. So I think there's a need to say if you're going to be, if you're, you're confident that you need to decarbonise the heat network, you have got to think much more about district heating and what you've got to do. There may well be a role for hydrogen in some cases, particularly where you've got somewhere like Fife, where you've got a much more dispersed area. But a lot of our cities lead themselves ideally to having district heating systems. You've got much higher density housing in Scotland with the tenements and the, the flatted properties. And so they could lead easily to putting district heating system if we had both the political will and the regulation to actually make it happen. The political will, regulation and money. <laughs> but not enough money. Uh, there is a new housing estate getting built next to my housing estate and there's no district heating pipes getting put in. If there was a plan, you know, if that was part of the regulation, that would make it much more s simple to do. Having said that, 
we've got 41 educational establishments that have got direct electric heating with no wet system, so we couldn't put them on district heating, we couldn't put them on to any kind of decarbonised uh, system unless, you know, uh, we couldn't do 41 in 10 years with the money that we have at the moment. Uh, we put in, a, our team put in a bid for unfunded spending pressures, known as, where we were going to try and uh, get some of them done. Some of them. And they're all urgently needing done because they're completely at the end of their lives. Our bid was number one bid. It didn't get financed because the councillors felt that other things were more pressing, like social care of elderly people and provision for nurseries for under threes and lots of other things that just needed to be done. So we, get, we made the best possible case to get the money and we didn't get the money. Now, under time pressures, so I think we'll find, finish matters up there with the unfunded spending pressures example that you've given. And thank you very much to our witnesses. I'll suspend this session and we'll reconvene at about 11 o'clock. Thank you very much.
Uh, welcome back, everyone, and uh, welcome to our second panel of witnesses today. We have with us, um, first of all, David Handley, who's Head of Regulation at uh, SGN. Welcome to you. Fiona Goodenough, who is the Hydrogen Project Manager for the Scottish Cities Alliance. Welcome to you as well. Uh, Keith McLean, who is the Chair of the UK ERC Advisory Board and Stuart Hazeldean, who is Professor of Carbon Capture and Storage at the University of Edinburgh, so welcome to the two of you as well. Um, I'd like to start with a question about local heat and energy efficiency strategies. And the question is, first of all, whether or not local authorities should be required to produce a heat and energy efficiency strategy, and also whether or not this would be best done by individual local authorities or by a local, local authorities in conjunction with each other and how, how that would work. So I'm wondering who would like to start off on that point. Um, uh, Keith perhaps, McLean. Perhaps I could uh, convene, if I just clarify, um, although I'm the chair of the UK Energy Research Centre, um, I'm speaking as an individual rather than representing that as an organisation to date. Um, I think lo local authorities um, have a key role to play in heat and energy efficiency strategies simply because of their local knowledge and their involvement in uh, so much to do with housing, um, planning and building standards, other relevant uh, elements. Uh, but I don't think that they on their own are able to do what is necessary uh, because uh, so many of the solutions, particularly for decarbonising heat as opposed to energy efficiency, will require the provision of infrastructure, which is simply not in the gift of a local authority. Therefore, it makes it very difficult for a local authority to um, put forward a strategy um, if it doesn't know whether it will have hydrogen in the gas pipes, if it will have... Uh, if there will be hot water pipes for district heating or if indeed the electricity system is going to be reinforced to allow some of the electrification to take place. Therefore, they may uh, play a key role, but they, it will be absolutely necessary for uh, there to be input from these other bodies responsible for what are monopoly networks um, and uh, monopoly regulated networks. Um, I think with regard to the coordination question that you uh, raise implicitly, yes, I do think that they need to work together because although there are local specificities in the individual strategies, um, it is essential that uh, there is common learning so that from um, what others have done, that there is pooling of resources, which are always rather tight, um, and that there are common standards and approaches that individuals and consumers can expect um, from local authority to local authority. Thank you. Fiona, good enough. Hi, um, I can only speak, obviously, on behalf of the cities. Um, my colleagues, we all have different work streams that we are taking uh, forward on behalf of the government for the seven cities. Um, I work predominantly on, on hydrogen, whereas another colleague works on, on the low-carbon agenda, and we have a number of different areas that we are concentrating on with the seven cities to bring about that collaboration, to share the knowledge, to engage with um, whoever we need to be engaging with to carry out um, these projects to actually get that scale across the seven cities. And that includes bringing about district heating strategies. Dundee have written theirs, and they would like to be able to go forward and write their own um, energy strategy for the city. Um, and I think other cities feel exactly the same. If not, they can't complete it now, at least they have something they, that is, uh, is written there in black and white, why, in a few years' time, why they're actually doing what they are doing. And they have a focus as well. Stuart Hazeldean. Uh, I think the answer to this also depends on what you're trying to deliver. Uh, so I see you're trying to deliver two types of thing in very simple terms. You're trying to deliver energy efficiency and lower priced energy is what you've been talking about this morning. But you've also got to deliver zero carbon energy by 2050. And that's a very different sort of question. And I'm concerned that if we uh, do this on a local authority level, rather like Keith McLean was saying, you can end up with, easily end up with the wrong answer 
because our app people are answering a question which they can see a local bottom-up vision to, being how do we install a heat network, let's say, in the buildings we have control over, which may lead you to a wrong conclusion about where we're going to get our energy from. And where we're getting our energy from may rely on top-down solutions, national electrification or nat national hydrogen networks, which need a very different design process and a very different uh, connectivity and cooperation between all of the local authorities across Scotland. So I think you have to be careful what question you ask, because that will determine what time scale and what answer you get. David Handley. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me here to speak to you today. Um, in similar, sort of common with a lot of the speakers beforehand, we see local authorities have a very important role here in terms of a very important central coordination function. They're the people which can really link in multiple groups and help to create those bottom-up plans. What we do need to make sure, however, is that we have consistency across regions because it's that consistency in terms of the regulation and it's that consistency in terms of the market structures which helps promote investment and bring about things at least cost. I think. Thank you. And I'll move on to second question from Dean Lockhart. Uh, thank you, Convener. There seems to be consensus that local authorities can play a vital and should play a vital role in these uh, strategies. Can I ask two questions? Uh, first of all, uh, whether local authorities have the necessary skills, resources and the relevant support to successfully measure and implement this strategy. And the strategy sets out 12 key functions. I, I won't list them, I'm sure you're aware of them. Um, would you care to comment on whether you think those 12 key functions are appropriate? Are there too many? Uh, should, should more be added? Uh, just an overall sense of whether or not those 12 functions are uh, appropriate and relevant. Thank you. I can start. Um, I think certainly I'd like to come back in terms of the skills and resources question, because I think this is something which we find particularly important in terms of working in partnership with the local authorities to make sure that we're able to deliver the skills and the resources if, where there's sort of shortcomings and make sure that we're able to provide an effective sounding board. And I think this is particularly important when we're looking at some of the innovation projects and saying how do we bring out innovation in a way which is flagged for those local authorities, their specific needs. I think in terms of resourcing, um, Certainly, um, most of the conversations that I've been part of or have heard would suggest that the resourcing levels are nowhere near where they would need to be in order to carry out all of the, the different functions that are needed. Um, and even if there were adequate resource, I don't think it is sufficiently knowledgeable yet. And that's a key characteristic, I'm afraid, of the heat policy arena at the moment. It is one that was ignored for many years um, there was often just a simple phrase in uh, decarbonisation scenarios that will decarbonise heat and transport through electrification, tick, job done. Uh, but actually, in reality, it's probably the most difficult area to address. So uh, whether it's in academia, whether it's in um, organisations uh, like local authorities, I don't think that there is yet the, the knowledge to um, be able to make the necessary decisions. And that's something that we're going to have to build up not only through education, but also through practice. And some of the solutions that we're talking about, particularly um, hydrogen or, or heat pumps, um, and even district heating, we have very little experience of that. We have very little practical experience of applying it in Scotland. And therefore, we need to do appropriate pilots to gather that knowledge and experience before we can make any of the key decisions that need to be made um, in, in regard to the decarbonisation. Thank you. I should say to our um, witnesses, there's no need to answer every question, but certainly feel free to come in and join the discussion on the individual questions as they're raised. Um, I'd like to come on now to a question from Ash Denham. Thank you, Convener. So obviously we've got a proposed new regulatory approach in order to try and promote um, district heating. So I'm just wanting to get the panel's views on whether you, what you think about the regulations, whether you think the regulations are fair, and whether you think they strike the right balance between the idea of choice and also compulsion. Can I maybe 
follow, follow on on that. I think the, um, the, the problem is we're, we're, we're sort of grasping at one particular aspect of the heat challenge, which is district heating. And district heating is not the right answer in every case. Um, and it, it, there are areas where it is a good solution, but there are others where uh, it probably isn't. Um, I would highlight in particular the link to energy efficiency. If we really do build new properties to a high standard, the heating requirement is so low, it doesn't justify the cost of district heating to actually um, but pro provide it. You can do it with very simple um, uh, uh, means that don't have the same capital costs. Similarly, with district heating, there's a, a, a clear dilemma at the moment between the density that you need, the customer density that you need to make the economics work, uh, but what, the, the most dense urban areas are the most difficult to put district heating in. I, I barely need to remind you here in Edinburgh of the chaos that was caused by digging up the streets for the limited exercise of putting in the tram network. Now just imagine doing that right throughout the whole city or throughout all of the cities over a 20 year period. So it's not just the costs, but the non-cost the non factors that you need to think about. So I, th I think that where district heating is uh, uh, suitable and where therefore we need regulation to deal with it, the proposals that are made, I think, um, start to address some of the, uh, the right points. But even there, it's important to recognize uh, that the, um, there are different reasons for introducing the, uh, the regulation in the first place. Customer protection uh, is, is really, really important at the supply end, but so is giving people access and way leave rights to put in the pipes in the first place um, and to uh, find ways of regulating the asset base as is done for other monopoly networks in order to get uh, the, the risks down and the cost of capital down as, as well. So I think it goes some way to addressing some of those issues. But the key one that I don't think that there is an answer yet to uh, in Scotland or UK-wide is the last one that you mentioned about compulsion, that if you are going to make district heating work, as the Danes have done, they're always given as the classic example, the Danes have, a, um, have regulations in place which mean that you have to connect to it, basically. Um, you can, I suppose, choose to heat your home electrically at, uh, at, at very high cost as an alternative, but you have to still pay the fixed costs of it. And I don't think that we're quite in a position yet to tell people um, that they have to do it. And without that, I can't see the economics working. Yes, Stuart Hazeldean. We have to be careful about just applying this one-size solution. So I agree that district heating is not automatically a good thing. Where you can link in other sources of wasted heat, then it can be a helpful and efficient opportunity. But if you're just trying to replace uh, dozens or tens and tens of uh, individual boilers in people's houses, which are already very efficient, with an equally efficient central district heating system, I don't see any gain. There's no gain in carbon saving. There's no gain in efficiency. Uh, and you have a huge infrastructure cost. And what I never see with any of these is a pricing per household of what it's actually really going to cost. You know, maybe it's going to cost £10,000 a household. Maybe it's going to cost twenty or £30,000 a household. But we need to work out where the correct value for money actions are rather than saying this is what we're going to mandate nationally. And I think also the track record of district heating schemes around the UK seems to be patchy. So if they're well run by the monopoly owner, then yes, you can produce a saving for the incumbents in the property. If they're poorly run, then the incumbents are stuck with that monopoly and they end, could end up paying double the price of what an ordinary heating system is. So it's essential that it's going to be a regulated type of industry appropriate for the delivery you're trying to do, whether it's individual buildings or small complexes or whatever. And that regulated industry has to be uh, achieve its performance targets like everything else. That's it. Um, I just add to that. Um, I think completely sort of building on the points about sort of district heating being the right solution in specific areas. There's lots of other solutions as well which we need to be promoting in terms of decarbonising heat. They also need to play a part. Where we are looking at district heating, then 
the question which you raise about does the regulatory model which is proposed go far enough, I think is something which potentially we need to create more of a structure around the regulatory model to ensure that both the consumers and also the investors have confidence in it and are able to get the lowest cost of capital into it. And that really does mean sort of putting in a regulatory structure where you, you have confidence over a long-term period that bills aren't going to sort of vary unnecessarily, that the investors are going to be able to get their low sort of cost of capital in, and then potentially it can work very successfully. Where it comes to compulsion, then I would immediately start to become very, quite nervous because I don't know whether the public is with us yet. And bringing the consumer alongside us in terms of trying to make something like this work is absolutely essential. And just in terms of um, the experience I've had working with local authorities in the cities, um, obviously, you know, Aberdeen, uh, they have their heat and power company and Dundee, um, Perth and Angus are trying to set up their own ESCO, etc., etc. Um, but where they have actually put in district heating schemes, they have been very, very successful in social housing. Um, and these tenement blocks are 71% more efficient. Um, the problem is that some of the tenants have been so used to fuel poverty, particularly in Dundee, that they're terrified of using it, and it's all that education on that side too. But at least it's going somewhere. I'm not saying it's a panacea, but at least there is something to really tackle a very difficult problem in fuel poverty. Okay, thank you. Um, another question from John Mason. Uh, thanks, convener. And I think building on what Ash Denham has been asking about um, with district heating, I mean, I actually have the Commonwealth Games Village in my constituency, so they all moved in knowing that they were going to be part of a district heating system. And I think it would be fair to say there have been a number of teething problems, uh, not least because there's different types of housing tenure, and even the different housing associations don't charge the residents in the same kind of way. So it is quite complex. But, but the whole area of risk, uh, I mean, in the uh, paper, the consultation paper, it talks about design risk, construction risk, operational risk, demand market risk, performance risk, financial risk, and regulatory risk. I mean, just reading these is quite scary to start with. Um, how, how can we manage all of these kind of risks, or are some of them more serious than others? Um, if I can try and respond to that quickly. Um, I must admit, when I saw the list of risks, I had a similar response. Um, they're all very real. Those, all those risks are very important, and they all need to be recognised. I think you can simplify it, however, by effectively categorising risk into what's the risk of construction and getting the project away, and then what's the risk of the operation and the long-term operational asset. And by almost creating a regulatory framework which addresses the long-term sort of asset management aspect, then people know what they're constructing and they know how to design the risk of construction accordingly. Now, there's still things, barriers, etc., which need to be removed. But in my mind, it's that distinction between the operational lifetime and the putting the equipment in the ground. Okay. I think, again, there's, there's a question. This isn't new to people in the energy industry. Those are the sorts of risks that are managed um, through gas supply, through electricity supply um, already. Um, the question is, what is the justification for introducing another asset class uh, uh, so alongside gas and electricity and water and all the others that we have, it, what is the justification for adding a, a new class um, with a new set of risks, a new set of players? Um, and where that makes sense, where those risks can be easily managed, then fine. Uh, but I think there are um, a, a lot of other risks associated with district heating, um, which other than some of the new build, some of the retrofit in, in high-rise uh, buildings or, or others where it, there are, uh, is perhaps a good economic justification for it. I think going at it whole scale and um, having all of this risk management, um, additional risk management to deal with um, is, is, a, is a question that uh, needs to be addressed seriously. That is just because in Scotland we're relatively new at district heating and so for example things that come up in my area are we don't know what the maintenance costs are going to be we don't know how long 
pieces of the plant are going to last, so we don't know when they'll need to be replaced. But presumably these are the kind of questions that over time we will become more familiar with. Yeah. So, uh, absolutely. But um, since all of them have already been answered for the gas network that, so that serves about 80% of the population at the moment, why would you uh, introduce an, a new set of risks that we know less well in order to deal with that if there is an alternative solution to continue to use the gas network. And this is the, the point that um, is increasingly being looked at, um, particularly in countries like the UK with a very strong gas network, whether it can be repurposed in the future to continue providing the role that it has done for um, decades now of, of providing the energy into our homes for individual heating solutions with, with gas boilers. If that can continue, then it is a way of avoiding a lot of disruption, a, a way of avoiding a lot of additional and new risk, uh, which will always um, be more difficult to manage than the risks that we know. And it, it's why I think at a national level, it's really important that we understand quite clearly what the options for using hydrogen in place of natural gas are going to be before we start looking at mass conversion to district heating or um, electrification. And the, the one point I would really want to emphasise is district heating is not low carbon. It's not a low carbon technology. If you have your district heating in Poland, it's very efficient, but it's run by coal and it's very, very carbon intensive. All, pretty much all of the uh, major district heating schemes in, uh, across Europe use fossil fuels because that they're cheap enough. The district heating with low carbon sources is even more expensive to do and we don't actually have the low carbon sources to, to, to deal with, with it in, in the first place. So there's another risk to uh, you know, that, it's not, that it's not low carbon. So f if decarbonisation is the task, then we have to be very, very clear where the decarbonised energy for district heating would actually come from in, in the first place. I think Professor Hazeldean wants in. So I just want to back up that point that builds on what we talked about at the beginning of this session, that you have the dual motives of low cost, effective, efficient heat supply plus low carbon. And if you go ahead and develop many local heat centres throughout a city, which are all individually burning methane gas or even burning biomass, then you end up in a cul-de-sac around 2030 where you can not decarbonise those very easily. If you want to have a longer term vision, then you would start looking very seriously at decarbonising the gas supply and converting that to hydrogen, which can then entirely go to zero carbon effectively throughout the country, rather than just reducing carbon by 20 or 30 percent, which is what we're talking about with district heating. So effectively in money terms, again, we have to think about the money looking at hydrogen substitution for methane gas into the existing infrastructure could be three times or ten times cheaper than district heating. I mean, Ms. Goodenough, I don't know if this is your kind of area here with, as we talk about hydrogen. I mean, how, <laughs> I suppose my next question is, how long do we need to wait till we can really make a decision on is it hydrogen, is it district heating? Because what we're getting a lot of, there could be, or it mm -hmm. might be, or we, we're going to work yeah. out the costs, but do we need to act? We've, we've been waiting quite a while, to be honest with you. Hydrogen's only just started to, uh, you know, that new word around the place. Um, it's, it's Hydrogen's always been, oh, no, no, ne never hydrogen. Um, I do think it has a massive role to play, but a lot of people have to be convinced about the costs of injecting hydrogen into the gas grid. And some academics say great, uh, some academics say absolutely no, that you would need 43% more hydrogen and all these sort of numbers are, you know, flailing around. But until we actually do the trial in Scotland, which SGN are going to be undertaking, we still need to do that trial um, to, to convince everybody. Leeds City Gate was ambitious and fantastic project but it left a lot of uncertainties around those final numbers, and that's something that we really need to address. I, I am still convinced that it has a huge role to play. If you're trying to decarbonise heat... Um, Should there be a pause of heating until we get, find out a bit no, more? No, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, it's down, to, it's down to local authorities when they're trying to deal with fuel poverty, um, etc. We're very slow, to be honest with you, um, to actually get... and. 
we're risk averse at, at really doing really large scale projects. You know, the stuff we're doing at the moment is really novel. Um, we lack the funding, we lack the support to really get, to start to really scale up, if I'm very honest. <laughs> Um, thank you. Perhaps just a further brief comment from Professor Hazel Dean, then we'll move on to question from Andy so I'm Whiteman. In, uh, I'm in favour of getting on with pilots, as has been described, because otherwise we'll never have any real knowledge about this. And pilots can be at scales of uh, tens of tens of homes or a th thousand dwellings. Uh, this doesn't stop you also in parallel, because these are, this is a multi-decade transition we're talking about. In parallel with that, yes, fit district heating in local authority tenements where that's appropriate, but what we have to bear in mind is we should be doing that with the point of view that we may be changing the energy source from methane to hydrogen in 10 or 15 or 20 years' time. So you want to build in that uh, resilience and that opportunity to change into the future so we don't build our infrastructure expensively into a cul-de-sac. Thank you. And question from Andy Whiteman now. Uh, thank you, uh, Convener. The, the consultation proposes um, uh, local authorities be given the power to zone for, for district heating and also um, powers as well to award exclusive concessions to develop and operate district heating schemes. Do you broadly agree that local authorities need that power to zone uh, areas for district heating and are exclusive concessions the way forward for the construction and operation of district heating? Um, so. In terms of zoning and concessions, I think certainly zoning, whether you need, there's, as we alluded to, there's a critical role of local authorities in terms of coordination, and certainly zoning potentially helps progress towards that level of coordination and creates a clear signal around that. Um, I think the question in terms of concessions, though, is then in terms of Actually, what do we mean by a concession? Because concession can mean a multitude of things from a full, fully regulated model through to a very light touch concession. And I suspect if we're looking more at the sort of established robust regulation, then I suspect it could be potentially quite useful and in terms of promoting district heating. I think the key thing then is then making sure that you've got coordination in terms of the concessions so that you don't have a sort of multitude of patchwork approach of concessionary sort of structures across the whole area. Any other thoughts? Again, it's just the same point uh, that you'd need to understand the reasoning for the zoning. Um, and is, while we're still considering how we approach electrification and repurposing of the gas grids, um, you would want to be sure that you were going for low regrets zones, that, you know, that, that it made sense to do that anyway. And there are good reasons for district heating because it is an efficient way of producing and distributing and storing um, heat for, for use. So where you've got that, then it makes sense to have a model within that zone as to how the, uh, a developer and operator will be given the opportunity to tender for that and then to um, have, have some sort of concession or in, in, in order to, um, to build and then run the, the, the system. Uh, but I think we need to ref confine that in the first instance to these clear low regrets areas where it makes sense to do it anyway. Yeah, I, I, I hear that's a very clear, clear, clear message, I think. Um, I don't know if you've got any thoughts as well on the proposal to create a government-owned energy company uh, and whether that might have a role in the delivery of district heating. Um, and again, I'm, I'm afraid I'm not familiar enough with the details, because I think a government-owned energy company can be either on the supply side or it can be a vertically integrated company. Um, I'm not sufficiently clear in terms of exactly what the plant proposal is to understand which of those structures is being proposed. Many that aren't much detail at the moment. That's I'm just right, wondering, yes. <laughs> from, from experience with other countries, for example, yeah. whether what, what this is a very large transition that has to be made over a, a number of decades, um, and therefore government has a big, big role to play, whether yeah. there are any examples of government playing a kind of leadership transition role. 
maybe not in district heating, mm. maybe in other aspects of the energy. I think it's, it's worth remembering that nearly all of our energy infrastructure was built in the public sector. Um, we've done remarkably little in, in the private sector that hasn't been predetermined by um, legislation or, or regulation, and that's still the case. And I think there are some very clear questions as to certainly whether um, the... I think the in, in order for markets to play their best role, they need clarity in, uh, of purpose. And if uh, a clarity of purpose is given by a government body tendering for what needs to be done, perhaps to get it built, and then once it's built, um, tendering again so that that asset can be operated, um, then I think that can work quite well and it gets over the design and the construction risk which is often priced in very expensively in the cost of capital um, and I think for that reason it should definitely be explored um, but it should be done on the basis that it still will be the private sector that delivers rather than that we build up a massive uh, state owned and, and run organization which builds and runs everything at the end of the day but the, the, getting the cost of capital down um, the, the most clear examples of that that have been calculated have been with regard to nuclear projects where they um, believe that doing it uh, in that sort of way can get the cost cost of capital down from about 12 percent which is where Hinkley point c is to about three percent which would be the normal rate that would be applied to a government project and that makes a massive massive difference to the overall cost Uh, yeah, I th uh, personally think the role of uh, a government company in Scotland, let's say, would be the design and the architect of the system to give that long-term overview of planning and confident, and also multi-decade confidence that it's worthwhile engaging with this because we're serious about doing this over a number of years. And it's really in that uh, master planning of where you want to where you want to build pipes, where you want to build, try and build those first, where you want to build wires, where you want to build those first. Do you want to have a massive rollout of uh, district heating early on or do you want to wait and see a bit longer, which is what I think we're counselling at this end of the table. Uh, and But not to do the actual delivery. The actual boots on the ground, turning the spanners, welding the beams are done by private enterprise, and that, but that has to be contracted through that uh, system architect and at the moment in the UK I don't think we've got a very strong system architect role at all it's laid off from the Westminster government to National Grid or laid off to Ofgem or always laid off to somebody else who denies real overarching responsibility for it and that's not going to change our infrastructure very easily Thank you, Thank you. and a question from Richard Leonard uh, Thanks Convener, the um, uh, the watchword has been decarbonisation, but one of the other threads running through the energy strategy is decentralisation. And I just wonder whether you've got a view about the extent to which that applies, uh, whether, uh, I mean, presumably some of the support that lies behind uh, the keenness on district heating projects is precisely that, localised, decentralised uh, delivery mechanism. So uh, I guess my first question is just to get your views on that, whether you think that the, the, the energy strategy strikes the right balance between uh, a more centralised approach and a decentralised delivery? Uh, just on the point of central versus decentral, in, in my book, looking at the model that we have at the moment in the vast majority of homes where we have an individual boiler, we have probably one of the most decentralised heat production systems in the world. Um, and district heating is actually a process of re-centralising rather than decentralising. And it's uh, one of the reasons why it's always important when we're looking at energy debates to make sure that we don't dominate the concepts with what we do around electricity, which has tended to be what's been the case in the last 10, 15 years. Heat is very, very different. It is very, very local by its nature. And ultimately, you know, it will be heat in our home, which is what we're looking for. It will be hot water, it will be cooking, and uh, all those things at, at, at an individual building or an individual residence uh, level. So I, I think the, there's a, it, it's very difficult, therefore, to 
to say um, you know, whether central or local makes sense because ultimately we, we want it locally in our home. We don't want a, you know, a, a heat source on the top of Arthur's seat that we can all warm our hands on from a, from a distance. So I, I think the, the, the centralization of the solution, though, to perhaps be a bit more serious about it, you know, electrification and um, decarbonized gas are a much more um, centrally determined solution. You can't have somebody choosing to have hydrogen um, in one house in the street and somebody else having methane and somebody else having biogas uh, in, in the others. That, and if we are going to make significant in infrastructure investments, either in electrification or in repurposing the gas grids, those are going to be much more um, national in, in their character. But even district heating, as I said before, you need a source of um, low carbon heat for it. Uh, that may well be el electricity, that may well be hydrogen, but equally as with the new pro project in Glasgow, it might be taking heat out of the River Clyde um, with a heat pump. Um, and so I, I think that um, we need to keep a very open mind uh, as to whether the best solution is uh, a central or a, a local one, um, and uh, that, that you know the, there isn't a single uh, silver bullet, and therefore there isn't a single answer to what what is best for a particular area. Can I just understand a bit? And maybe Stuart Hazeldean can answer this. Um, you, you said that uh, you were cautioning, or you were, you were counselling caution at that end of the table, uh, and I think we all get that message felt loud and clear. But is that a reaction against an action? In other words, are you saying, well, just let's take this steady as she goes rather than leaping headlong into putting all our resources into district heating, for example. I mean, in other words, do, will you see in all likelihood a role for district heating? It's just maybe not as big as some people are estimating it to be at the moment. Uh, much more the second from my own point of view. So I think it's premature to make any of these big decisions because we don't, we've only engaged with the problem on heat seriously really for a, a few years in Scotland. So district heating, <coughs> we've had examples where individual buildings or small groups of buildings can benefit from district heating and that's, those are going ahead to be developed. So it's a low hanging fruit analogy rather than a geographic swathing through analogy. And so, yes, let those thousand flowers bloom. So the regulation and the policy and the approach should permit those to pop up and emerge where local knowledge and local uh, enthusiasm might uh, permit that to happen. But I also strongly support Keith's point that the provision of the basic energy vectors is often and even usually going to be still centrally provided. So there's still going to be, even if we've still going to be a need for centralized or a grid of, of electricity. So even if everybody has some solar panels on their house, they want electricity at night. Uh, even if people might like to have wind power, they still want electricity in February when the wind doesn't blow. Those are going to require national backup systems and national infrastructure systems. If we choose to change our biggest heat delivery system, being methane gas, supplying 80% of dwellings, if we choose to keep that as methane gas, we will miss our carbon targets. So you're in a stuck situation there in 2030. If you choose to change that delivery of methane to all electricity, you need to have absolutely unfeasible numbers of renewable build, which we have no idea of how to do deliver at all. Or if we choose to repurpose that into hydrogen, then it's very difficult to envisage or impossible to envisage producing that hydrogen at cheap cost locally, you will have 10 or 20 hydrogen production facilities around Scotland producing that hydrogen to send through the pipes, which is a national infrastructure role. So it's a mix of horses for courses. Quickly. I think it's very important to recognise that we've already got a very established, well sort of developed network in place, which is running at sort of low cost. And as part of the ions replacement program, where we're going through and replacing all the iron pipes, certainly at the sort of more local level, we're replacing those with PPEs of the plastic pipes, which in it sort of helps to then create the sort of hydrogen economy and, and enables further gases to be transported through those pipes. 
So it's important to make sure that we're using the assets that we've got available because that helps us to deliver that decarbonized heat at least cost. I mean, could I make one more um, comment just on the timing? The, the um, carbon intensity of heat production at the moment is relatively low. Um, because we burn gas quite efficiently, the um, carbon intensity of, 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 um, of heating in most people's homes is about half the UK electricity level, which means that... Um, we have to bring down the carbon intensity in other sectors for quite some time before the heat sector becomes the limiting factor. That gives us the advantage that we have a little bit more time to find optimal solutions for the heat sector and why uh, we should pr properly wait for SGN and others to complete the um, uh, tests that they're going to be doing so that we have the full practical experience of things like hydrogen to uh, actually base our decisions on. And certainly at a UK level, uh, most of the thoughts um, that from the Climate Change Committee for the period of heat decarbonisation, it is the 30s and the 40s um, rather than the 20s because in the 20s, A, we need to be preparing, and B, there are other greater priorities in the power sector and in the transport sector uh, where we can make uh, more substantial gains. So I think there are some questions about the timing, um, and uh, you know, I, I think that particularly the, the timing in the energy strategy for uh, the targets of 2032, I think, could prove... You know, I think they're ambitious and laudable for being ambitious, but my worry would be that they could be horrendously expensive if we rush into them uh, without having done the preparatory work and actually before it's probably necessary uh, in order to get on that 2050 trajectory. Professor Hazeldean. Uh, this is just really for the record rather than what we're talking about today is because in the climate change plan in Scotland I think we've not recognized the connection between making hydrogen available for heating networks and the possible connection of hydrogen availability for transport where we've also got another problem because one will enable the other yeah. as well and so the energy modeling needs to ask a specific question of how does that connect and how does that reduce the cost of entry and the cost of rollout of a network for hydrogenating transport with fuel cell vehicles which could be much more effective and less cost than electrification of vehicles where we're currently headed so again, we've run the risk of deciding too early and going down a cul-de-sac. Thank you. And now, Jackie Bailey. I wonder whether I could pursue this just a little bit further, because um, politics is all about timing. So I'm, I'm curious to know from SGN um, when you anticipate that these trials will be complete and when we'll get a sense if, if actually replacing methane gas with hydrogen is, is a real possibility, um, because... I hear what you say about 30s and 40s for implementation, but when will we know? Because big infrastructure projects take quite a bit of planning. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this builds on a point which was made earlier in the sense that we are... Decarbonisation of heat is a significant challenge which hasn't been fully addressed yet. So we're at the beginning of this curve. Um, in terms of the sort of hydrogen projects that are currently underway, Currently, that's looking at a feasibility study, which is likely to take a couple of years. That's going to be identifying the next sites, which will then, and I can provide precise timings to you on this, but will provide sort of effectively a demonstration plant, hopefully sort of three to four years after that, once the feasibility has been completed. I think one thing which is very important to not to lose sight of is that there's the pilot studies themselves, but then there's also the surrounding safety case. And a lot of what the, the work that we did in terms of a pilot project over in Oban, in terms of opening up the gas market, was looking at what are the gas safety regulations for broadening out the bandwidth for allowing different gases to go through. Those sorts of changes take time to put, go through and make sure that everybody's comfortable with that, and we shouldn't lose sight of that, because that's a very important part of the story as well. I think we would be interested in further detailed information on that. So the other thing to remember about hydrogen is it's not that new. Up until the 60s, 50% of the gas that was in our gas networks was hydrogen. 
Um, town gas was a, a, a strange mixture, but f as I say, about half of it was hydrogen, and the rest was a mixture of hydrocarbons and carbon monoxide, um, which was why it was so effective as a, um, with your head in the oven as a, a, a means of en en ending it all. Um, but the... Uh, Detail too far. <laughs> Stuart Hazel, do um, so just to build on that, whilst absolutely supporting Scottish gas networks in their safety culture, and that's absolutely essential, then the, I'm also interested that this is not necessarily all or nothing, in that uh, the gas network could, much of the gas network seems to be rated for 10% hydrogen, because historically, up till about 10 or 15 years ago, that was allowed to have that content of hydrogen. So you could as a specu academic speculation, spike, if you like, insert 10% hydrogen into our existing gas delivery without any adverse consequences. Obviously, SGN will advise us on how tractable that is. But you can start to do this, and we, I could buy in, effectively, a hydrogen generating plant with carbon capture and storage which is operating, there are several examples already operating worldwide. This is known technology. I could drop that into St. Fergus, generate hydrogen, feed that into the grid, take away the carbon dioxide, and that could be operating in 2022, from my perspective. I've not done this with SGN, so anything they say about safety I will totally concede to, but I'm just giving you an illustration that we can get on with large-scale pilots and gain more information. So I don't want to wait, but I rather want to progress at the appropriate pilot scale. Okay, that, that, that's very interesting, sorry. Just to echo that point, I think there is absolutely agree that there is a lot of work which we can be getting on with in terms of increasing the blend over the next sort of four or five years, absolutely. We're not clear yet in terms of where the absolute limits are in terms of the safety case, but I think it's fair to say that we've got a fair amount to go for there in terms of decarbonising gas, which should keep us busy for at least the next five years. And, and National Grid ha have already started um, trials of injection on a, an isolated university campus at Keele University. Uh, they will be operating with um, the sort of blends that Stuart is talking about. And that's, that's already underway. Okay. So, also an opportunity um, in the slap bang in the middle of Dundee City, there's a very large national grid stroke SGN owned site. It's been like that for the last 20 years. And it couldn't be for residential or anything else. It really needs uh, another sort of brown, it's a really brownfield site that um, is ideal for carrying out this sort of testing that we'd like to do, which would be integrated energy system. Because obviously I really concentrated on the transport side because you need the demand and buses take the demand and then we decarbonise in our city centres. So there's a massive opportunity there that um, we could work with, you know, together on that. Um, equally, I'm still continuing to work with our European partners. We are, we are now undertaking some very large-scale projects, very ambitious projects across Europe um, in terms of putting in hydrogen infrastructure and fuel cell buses and fleets. And there's another incentive now underway about working with cities and regions about how do we actually start to really commercialise hydrogen technology right across all the sectors. And that is something that I'm taking forward with the cities. Um, I'm hoping they will sign the MOUs and then we will work as a, a working group to take forward that. So together with Europe and international partners, we, we could really start to make a big change in Scotland. Um, Aberdeen is, uh, already has the largest fleet of hydrogen buses in Europe. Mm. I know. I think the committee have taken evidence on this before. Um, can I turn to the questions I was supposed to ask you, which is slightly different? Um, uh, obviously, the, the, there are likely to be opportunities, but also challenges as well um, for existing industrial plant that generates, you know, waste heat. And I wondered whether you saw um, any possibility of them connecting to say whether it's a district heating network or other heating network. Uh, clearly it's possible, and a lot of the heat mapping that's been done for Scotland has, has identified sources of uh, w waste heat. Um, the difficulty there is just how sustainable is that going to be? Um, where's that heat coming from at the moment? It's probably coming from burning fossil fuels. So will that actually be able to continue? Um, and there's also the other big problem. Uh, when I used to be with SSE back in the 1990s, we were developing combined heat and power plants. And 
the big issue there was that the industries, like the paper industry that we were heavily um, uh, involved with at the time, unfortunately in the 2000s went bust and suddenly there was no heat anymore. Um, and it, so you've got to think, if I've got a big source of heat, uh, what am I going to do, A, if it breaks down, uh, so what's the, where's the backup going to come from? And B, what happens if it goes long term uh, out of business or if it converts to something else? So uh, I, th I think particularly with the pressure on decarbonisation at the moment, you would need to really be clear that you were making a worthwhile investment in the heat networks to, to uh, utilise that heat and that it was going to be available or some alternative was going to be available because these heat networks, you know, a lot of the economies on them work over 40, 50 years, just like the pipes and the, the cables in the rest of the industry. So if that's not the, top, the sort of uh, sustainability in the long term, uh, then it's questionable whether that, that, that extra investment's worthwhile. I'll stop there, convener. Okay, thank you. Now, Gordon MacDonald. You know, um, I, I get the impression from the earlier discussion that we need some form of regulation in relation to district heating. And um, one of the comments about, was about the patchy performance of the existing district he heating schemes. So we need some form of technical standards. And in relation to the lifetime of these projects, which you've indicated are quite long, we need some form of consumer protection as well. So given that, is there any drawbacks or challenges that a licensing system might create? And given the devolved settlement that we've got, do we actually have the powers to introduce licensing? Um, I think a correctly structured license, I think, can address a lot of the challenges which you've identified because ultimately, and this is something which we see in networks all the time, is if you're linking sort of performance and returns through to outputs and incentivizing sort of good delivery and ensuring that your customer satisfaction scores are there and the customer has knowledge and comfort in terms of what their bill is going to be and has visibility of what that bill is going to look like and knows that that's going to be done on a fair and equitable basis, then that's a very strong structure through which to progress. In terms of the constitutional, sort of whether the powers are there is sufficient, I, I'm going to have to defer on that one, I'm afraid. Um, certainly, it has been noted by Ofgem that they don't currently have the remit to cover off into the district heating side. And whether that's something which is going to change or not, or what sort of timetables it's going to change, but there's clearly a, there, there appears to be a gap at the moment. Okay, we'll now come on to a question from Gillian Martin. I'm really interested in your views on how we are going to take the public with us and whatever that is that we decide to do, because I'm in this committee and I'm confused. You know, and, and there's a lot of choice out there and there's a lot of technical language around what we're talking about and your ordinary consumer has already got a situation where even they, they'd even take advantage of things like the, 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 the swapping of energy suppliers to the extent that we'd hoped. I'd just really be interested to see what your views are on how we can take the public with us and whatever, whatever we decide to do in the energy strategy. I think taking the customer with us is absolutely vital and it's an incredibly challenging thing to do because you've got multiple customers out there. Each one will respond to information in different ways and will find different things informative. I think what is clear is, and this has sort of been mentioned before, but sort of making sure that the customer doesn't go through unnecessary disruption and end up with a stranded asset is absolutely key to that. So making the right, or sort of making decisions at the time, using the existing equipment, sort of increasing the blends of decarbonized gas into the network, et cetera, so that the customer doesn't face a choice, in my mind is probably sort of preferable. And then whilst you then build out the district heating networks, et cetera, where there's a very, and consumers are able to move into that area in full knowledge of what they're sort of entering into rather than trying to bring about a substantial change and retrofitting a substantial change at a later stage and potentially imposing it. I see early public consultation 
events have to take place and education, education all the way, because it is very confusing, whatever we decide to go for. And you've got to have the public buy-in, because otherwise it's an absolute disaster. You know, um, like we, when we brought the buses in to Aberdeen, you know, the mixed messages, you know, and who were out there constantly, you know, reassuring the public, you know, why they were, we had these buses in Aberdeen. You know, it's really vital we, we do that. And we get very clear messages out um, why and what the benefits are to the public. What worked? It was, it was engaging, it, uh, public consultations, um, going to the schools, um, just reaffirming, you know, press statements out why we, why we were doing this in Aberdeen. Um, because the press will jump on anything you do when you're using the, you know, public money, and most of it was funded actually from Europe, but that wasn't the point. Um, they like to hang on the fact that the price of the bus and why won't we be pushing it into a school or into, into a hospital, same old things. And so then you'll have the operators will start to really back off because, you know, at the end of the day, they're running those buses in live operations, and then suddenly you've got the bus on the back of a low loader, and it's Stagecoach's logo all over it. And when it starts to affect like that, then um, you then have the private sector not wanting to work with you. So that's just one very small example. So it's really key that um, engagement with all the stakeholders is done very early before we even start, and tra the trials go on before you even come up with that. It's going to be panacea, I think, by the end of the day, um, but the people are very f informed of what we're doing. I think that um, we, we have to engage um, and inform people about what's happening. I think th there's a problem, though, in gaining acceptance for it, because all of the solutions that we're looking at at the moment for decarbonising heat are more expensive than the natural gas solution that people have at the moment. So we're already starting to climb up a hill rather than to ski comfortably down one, which we've done in the, uh, perhaps in the past. Nevertheless, there are um, some interesting examples from the past about how we've made big changes like this, and nearly all of them have had fairly clear regulation at the, the heart of them. So the Clean Air Act, which effectively switched people from using coal to using alternative heating sources. It was effectively a ban on coal for heating in, in cities. The changeover from town gas to natural gas was decided upon. It was done. There was then a, a, a program of, of change. Uh, we um, have had some very effective regulation for changing gas boilers to make them more um, energy efficient. We've had similar regulations for light bulbs and other things which have come in, which uh, people have uh, not really ultimately had a choice about. Uh, but apart from a few mo mo moans and groans, the, the only difficulty now is that sin since these things were always blamed on Brussels, uh, if we don't have Brussels to blame them on, then uh, we'll need to find some, some, somebody else to... Uh, uh, to, to, to <laughs> with all of that, uh, but it's a process of progressive nudging, as what I'm hearing, you know, all the time, and it's a question of uh, a strong government mission that we're going to be doing the right thing because it's better air quality, it's a better environment, we're more sustainable, and we're able to charge more in some cases for taking away rubbish to landfill. We now charge lots of money, but uh, clearly that's... Uh, got public buy-in because people can see that it's the right thing to do and it's created lots of jobs and so these things also create jobs and business and wealth so it's a it's not an onerous hair shirt burden we carry it's a it's about leadership it's about doing the right thing and it's about creating new types of jobs and new types of work and what's your response to the, the previous panel was talking about the importance of having a particular body that's overseeing all of this? Because that, that strikes me as being um, a key way to engage the public as well. Yeah, I think it's, it's essential. The scale of the task is so in, enormous over such a long period of time. Uh, it has to be done uh, in a way that is cross-parliamentary, cross-party. Um, and I also agree the skill set for such major programmes doesn't usually sit um, comfortably within the civil service. And I agree with the examples of uh, the Olympics or the Commonwealth Games as being good examples where there was a very, very clear set of objectives and um, the, the delivery was managed um, 
uh, independently but very effectively. I think in both, ca both cases, certainly we weren't late, which wasn't really a, an, an option in either of those. Uh, but other big infrastructure projects have, we've managed um, successfully, um, but they have to be done independently of, 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 of government. Um, you know, there's, the, what, 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 looking at 2050, we've got one chance at putting in a, a, any network, because it will still be there in 2050. Two chances at putting in generation, like um, gas or, or wind or, or, or solar. Maybe three goes at boilers and, and end users. But in that time, we'll have five price controls, seven UK parliaments, and 35 UK energy ministers. That, that's, the, that's the run rate at the moment. So I don't believe that we have a governance system at the moment that is capable um, of making the, uh, the, the key decisions. And although the tenure in p p position in Scotland is much longer than it has been in Westminster, there's still an awful lot of these things that will be dependent on that. So I think uh, with, with, between the UK government and the, the Scottish government, uh, we need to put a governance system in place which will be um, long, uh, long term, independent, and capable of, of uh, delivering the, the massive programmes. Thank you. And I think uh, follow up from Bill Bowman. Well, I, thank you, convener. I think actually Gillian Martin has probably covered most of the things I, I was going to ask about in terms of engagement and um, changing behaviour. What you seem to be saying is that that's a very important aspect and it has to start as soon as possible but we need to know where we're going before we start passing a message out or we get into one of your cul-de-sacs, I think you, you referred to earlier, just because the sat-nav today says that's the best route. It's maybe not based on the, the correct information. So uh, given the, the time scales we have, I mean, how stretchy are they going to have to be, do you think, to, to be realistic? I, I don't think they need to be stretchy. As I said, for, for heat, um, as, as we, we need to recognise that in order to get into a 20-year delivery programme, we need to prepare. We can't say, right, well, we need to start in the 2030s, so we'll make the decision in 20, December 2029. We need to prepare the path, but it is eminently doable. We've shown with major changes like the move from uh, natural ga uh, to natural gas from town gas that we're capable of that. We've shown through major energy efficiency programmes that we've been able to get the run rate of measures at the right sort of level. UK-wide, we're talking about 20 years, um, well, pro 20 year programmes with converting about 20,000 properties a week. So prorate that for Scotland, that's 2,000 properties a week in Scotland over a 2025 year programme that we need to be decarbonising. It's challenging, but it's eminently doable as long as we prepare the way and uh, make sure everything's in place for it to start. Which date were you talking about, the, the 2030 date? Yeah, I, 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 at the moment, I think that the, uh, the, the, we can be entirely consistent with um, climate change targets uh, by um, the, the rolling out the decarbonisation of homes, following also the energy efficiency programmes and so on that we were talking about which can be started beforehand um, in, in that sort of time scale. If we can start in 2025 in Scotland, th th even better. Uh, but I don't think that there's a false, um, that there's a, there's a need to Im impose a, an overly uh, challenging time scale, as I said before, because otherwise the, the cost challenge will just become too difficult. Yeah. So just to perhaps slightly disagree, uh, the objective for me is 2050 to have very, very low carbon across Scotland. And I think we'd probably all agree on that. And working backwards, 2030 is, or 2032 is just another milestone. 2025 is another milestone. Here we are in 2017. We've actually already started. We've been doing this for five or ten years, so we're not about to start. We're part way through. We're finding that the problem is we've done some of the easy, easier parts, the problem becoming more complicated, more interactive across horizontally, if you like, as well as tr the pathway we're going. So we need that better long-term security of governance. 
which will also help us inform to do the pilots, to do the experiments, so we can make the final decisions of some other things in 2025, and we'll be making final decisions on yet more things in 2030. But it's that preparation along, uh, along the journey, which is the, I think Keith was also talking about. So none of these intermediate dates matter in the sense of the final destination, but we've got to tick them off progressively, and we don't quite know which order they'll be ticked off with yet, because we're still doing the work. Certainly, I mean, the 2032 target is absolutely challenging, and I think it's absolutely right that it should be challenging, because I think, as an industry, we need to have challenging targets to respond to them. Now, I think that's very, by having that sort of challenge, then that helps focus minds, it helps focus attention in terms of addressing, saying, right, how do we go about addressing these challenges? But we shouldn't underestimate just how challenging that will be to get to that full percentage. So is it a chicken and egg situation or an inside-out puzzle situation? <laughs> I don't know that it's, uh, I, th I think we, we are starting, we can see um, a, a path to, to getting there. Um, I, I think that the Scottish Government's um, commitment to the, the, the SEAT programme and the, the sort of uh, recognition of the monies that are going to be necessary with, within that um, it, it has been a very good start. I agree. Uh, I, I, put, uh, I, I led the um, work across government and with the expert groups that put together the recommendations that turned into SEEP. Um, and m my report was, was finished in January um, 2015. So I, I agree with one of the previous uh, witnesses that it's a shame that we're um, still taking quite some time to, 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 to get there. Um, but nonetheless, I think it is um, a very strong commitment and I think that, if you like, that was the chicken or that was the egg. We've got that and we now just need to build on that and put the, the, the necessary plans in place. I think they're doable um, as long as there is the commitment and clearly as long as the funding does materialise for it. Right. Well, thank you very much to all of our witnesses. I'll suspend the session and we'll move into private session. Thank you very much.